All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to get things going here. Uh, before we begin our work session, we do have an interview tonight. Uh, we're interviewing Amy Crawford for appointment to the Affordable Housing Collaborative. Amy, come on up. Welcome. Thank you. I'll first say uh, thank you for your interest in uh, wishing to serve on this committee. And uh, we did receive your application, but if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you want to be on the committee. Sure. Uh, let's see. So I moved to North Kingstown about, I mean to South Kingstown about two and a half years ago. I raised my family in North Kingstown uh, for 30 years. And um, at the time I moved to South Kingstown, of course, we were just starting COVID. And my parents both got sick. And so over the past two years, I was caring for them. And um, they eventually both passed. So I have now retired from a career in nursing. And one, I have time that I feel like I can do things that, I, that matter most to me. Um, and uh, sort of the community has always been really important to me. Um, you know, I've always been involved in, in North Kingstown and following what was going on and, you know, with the cooperative preschool, all, you know, all the way from the time my kids were little. And um, in my job, I was a community nurse, um, as is in my application. That was for... 14 years, and so I worked with a population that really struggled with housing. Um, they were really the most vulnerable uh, families. I worked in Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls. Um, so I really got to see firsthand what it was like to try to find safe housing that, that people could afford, and it sort of saw the barriers to even applying for assistance with housing you know so I saw people working night and day and still not able to make ends meet so anyway so that was that became very you know apparent to me in my in my uh, professional life as well um, and so the other part of it is just that um, you know I want to give back to the community um, I feel like I work really well with other people. I've always worked in a team sort of environment, so I feel like I can work well with other people. And I happened to bump into um, somebody just, I, I met Joe Murphy from the planning committee and we just were, got talking and um, he sort of said, hey, you know, there's an opening. And I thought, well, maybe that's right down my alley. So that's what kind of prompted me to sort of fine. And I'm, I mean, I literally only retired on the 30th of, of December, um, though I'd been slowing down in my work and had decided that I wasn't going to like jump into to anything. And then this just sort of presented itself. And so I feel like it's a good place for me. All right. Thank you. Any questions from council members for Amy? I think um, your understanding of the complexity um, based from the view of the nurse and the health care field and understanding the needs of the community be really helpful. I think we're always looking for people who have a passion to serve because it is such a challenging um, problem just to find housing in general in all of South County. So I hope that um, you, you hopefully enjoy your time on the board and be Thank able you. to contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for members? All right. Thank you for your interest, Amy, and you should find out relatively soon. Okay. Thank you. That was, that was easy. Thank you. <laughs> I'll hang out and just listen. All right, now we're going to begin our work session. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to the town manager, Jim Manny, to walk us through the agenda. Thank you, Council President. We go to uh, item six, licenses. Uh, 6A is a special events permit for the 300th anniversary to hold a uh, bonfire on uh, Saturday, February 25th. Uh, from 6 to 9. Uh, B, 6B is a, uh, it's a new license uh, for a, uh, a place called Cake Licious, which is the formerly Sweet Cakes, um, right here, Peacedale. My wife's very sad that that's closing. So, 
Um, but um, th that's a new uh, victualling license. And the rest are uh, consents. We have a public hearing on seven, and that's for the CIP. Uh, finance director is here to answer any questions. Hopefully I can answer any questions you have. Uh, once again, we cut the CIP. The ask was about 3.5, 3.6 million by the directors. It was cut to about 1.8 million. And um, it was about a 5% increase from the year before, about $90,000 increase, which is pretty, uh, pretty good when you factor in all the uh, inflation we've had in the past couple of years. On the communications, uh, 8A, uh, a gentleman by the uh, name of Mr. DeSantis of Tri-County Community Action Agency, who's on Kingston Road across from the John Deere place, um, this, the, the tax assessor is here to explain it in much more detail, but basically it's this. That is like a quasi-agency that a lot of pass-through money goes through uh, in grants and funding for really good causes. Uh, people that need heating oil and uh, any type of public assistance. Um, but it, it's an agency that works very hard. It's federal money comes in, state money comes in, and helps uh, people in need. And his, it's a little complex, but his, he was given a pilot payment in lieu of taxes agreement that was never a, a Although it was, uh, the town council never voted on it from what I understand. It was, it was something that was drafted several years ago. But then he was given an abatement as well. So the, he has not paid taxes for the past two years, which comes out to about $12,000 a year. The total tax was 36000 He was given a $24,000 abatement by the town. But the, the, the former tax assessor allowed, really put him in like a tax exempt bracket but once again, that did not come before the town council. So uh, we're bringing it before the council tonight to explain this in much more detail than this and, and request that you consider he be con that he be tax exempt. He is, uh, Mr. DeSantis called us today in a panic. He tested positive for COVID right before the meeting, but he wanted to be here. I really don't see the need to continue this because he gave us all the information that you would need if you feel you're not getting enough information you feel free to continue it to a later meeting. Uh, 8B is a request by the Exeter Town Council um, uh, to provide a resolution, a request support in opposition to a legislative amendment proposed by the Rhode Island House of Representatives on the Land Use Commission, Housing Working Land Group to address housing shortage. Um, this really is a requirement by uh, ride, it relates to that, any abandoned schools that, um, that, that are, are abandoned in the town, you know, be every year the, the school department must uh, notify ride what they are and, and then it goes before a committee to see if they were eligible for affordable housing. So it, it's a, a controversial uh, law that uh, the uh, House of Representatives has and so Exeter opposes it and they asked for the support of this council. So that's a little bit different than what I read when I printed it out. So I don't know if anyone's printed out the resolution and the document. So I would recommend that you read it because the ex um, Exeter Town Council is very concerned about the um, Land Use Commission and so they feel, I could just read this to you, we believe that the recommendations would restrict existing municipal land use authority and could lead to a one size fits all statewide zoning. And so then it goes on because the, it, this land use commission is going to be presenting their findings to the speaker of the house who will then be presenting legislation. And it could mean a, a lot of things like the end of five acre zoning, which you know, if you are the type of person who wants to live in a home where you have lots of room to live your life, that's not gonna be available to you. So I think there's a lot of concern from communities that one central place is gonna tell us what land use looks like for every city in town. And you can understand why Exeter might be 
very concerned about farm, forest, and open space, the preservation. They go on to talk about the farms. It's, it's a, the, the actual letter itself is, is worth the time to read. So I, I didn't read it as the school building law. It's potential new legislation. So we can talk about it in the work session because I think the community should hear it too. But if you have five minutes, you might want to look at the last two pages of the nine pages. And Mark, just to be clear, everything that's uh, requested in this item here, nothing has passed House Senate signed by the governor. This is all pending legislation to be submitted by the House. Yep. Is that correct? Pending. Uh, with respect to the... Uh, There's actually a group, um, just to, to finish with that, it, there is a, a group of small rural communities that have formed an organization. Um, they include like Richmond, Charleston, Exeter, West Greenwich, um, et cetera, that are basically saying we're not necessarily opposed to providing the ho affordable housing. Of course we want that. But the approach that they fear the legislature is taking one size fits all. So the same rules that apply in Pawtucket would also apply in Foster. And they're asking <coughs> the legislature to consider not making it one size fits all, but coming up with more creative ways to deal with the affordable housing shortages in the rural communities and the smaller communities because obviously the cities have a whole different situation with bus lines and with services, et cetera you do not get in a rural community. Yep. So that's kind of what this is all about. Yep. That's a, he, so Mike, also, another question here to follow up. If the town takes action before this type of act is put into law by the state legislature, would the state's law preempt our local laws? Oh, yes, it would. Yes. Okay. Understood. So, so one of the things, if you think about it, you try to solve by increasing density where there's core services, water and sewer. In Exeter, there's only one place in Exeter that currently has public water and that's the Lad Center. So they're really saying like, why aren't you looking, state of Rhode Island, to use the Lad Center as a place for, for, to build housing instead of pushing it where there's all wells. And, and, you, and you can go back to July when we talk about, you can't keep building in South Kingstown because then we hear from the community, you keep building, and now we have more water bands. We have, right? So this, if you do have two minutes, if we finish this, I would recommend reading it, because it does talk about the concerns that they have, and they want to provide comments to the state so that the legislation comes out of the <coughs> speaker's office a, a better match to what they need. Because one, one size fits all, it's the same for Central, like you're saying, Central Falls, in South Kingstown, and we don't have the same services that they do either. Yep. So All right. that's this. That's how I read that. Jim, go ahead. Eight C was an email uh, dated January fourth to Mr. Tom Routliff of the Broadhill Residential Compound Homeowners Association. I, I see many of them entered just now. Uh, they are residents of that uh, area. And this is a discussion about <clears throat> um, the fairness and equity of some uh, town uh, privately owned roads being plowed and maintained by the town while others are not. I have a very detailed statistical analysis of how many miles of roadways, how many roads are covered by this. And um, I could either give you some of it now or we can just wait till the general meeting to give you all those statistics. and and. We could uh, make a decision at that point. Yeah, we can wait till then, Jim. You want to wait till then? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, 8D is an email from uh, Ms. Joanne Esposito, who is uh, the chair of the 300th Anniversary Committee, uh, requesting uh, to resign from the Economic Development Committee because of her, uh, the workload she has with that 300th Anniversary uh, Committee. Uh, 8E is an email from the council president requesting uh, Mr. Green of URI to present a study on mixed use zoning in South Kingston commercial highway districts. Uh, I believe he has a brief uh, presentation with some slides that uh, 
he's worked with IT to, to get him up on uh, the screen as soon as uh, he gives his presentation. I also have uh, our planning director here to answer any questions on, on that specific topic if you have any. Um, nine, town manager's report. Uh, director of Rabbit is here. He's the point of contact. He's the person that's really handling the study of opera money, where it's going. The council directed the $9 million to go to approximately 20 different projects, some big, some small. That was prior to me getting here. We are in the stages of, uh, of dispersing some of that money, uh, uh, plans to, uh, for construction of, of what uh, the priorities were of the council. But he's here tonight um, to especially provide insight to the two new members of the town council as to where that $9 million was allocated. That'll be a brief presentation as well with a, with a graph. B, uh, it was a request by several town council members to get an update on the Horsley Witten housing study, which was a study where about $100,000 was allocated a couple of years ago as a, this, this is a private consultant? Five years, Five years ago. Um, and uh, once again, Director Roberts here, he's been handling that. He can give you how much was spent, how much is left, and what the plans are moving forward. <laughs> 9C is the, uh, each meeting we give a very brief update on the school building committee. Uh, Director Luke Murray is here uh, just to go over what the next steps are and when the next meetings are. Let's go to 12, um, the new business. So this is really the first reading of, you know, it's the, uh, it's, it's authorizing the town clerk to advertise for the order of notice public hearing, uh, a zoning ordinance associated with the sale, cultivation, manufacture of recreational cannabis in the overlay districts. That's 12A. 12B, resolution authorizing the town clerk to advertise the order of uh, notice of public hearing related to proposed amendments regarding um, a waiver of interest for qualifying quarterly tax payments. Once again, this came up at a previous meeting and where this town does not have a specific policy where if someone pays their taxes late after the 30 day uh, window that they could be late, interest is tacked on, it usually goes back, depending on the quarter you're paying, goes back and you have to pay an interest penalty uh, for whatever remaining uh, taxes that you owe on your property. State law has the ability that towns can amend ordinances if they have them where you can have one late payment wa waiver of interest only in a five year period. So that is something that we're working on and uh, the solicitor can get into more detail on that. He's been working uh, on that ordinance as well. 12C, this one's related uh, to a resolution referring to the planning board or an amendment to the zoning ordinance about election signs or political signs. And once again, the solicitor has been working on that. It was a recent court decision on when, how long signs can stay up. Uh, and solicitor Sill has been doing a lot of research on that and what the town should do to amend the current ordinance that we have. 12D is a resolution adopting a proclamation uh, for National Gun Violence Survivors Week in South Kingston, a request to adopt a proclamation. The, uh, the week is February 1st to February 7th. ENF of consents. G and H relate to the purchase, let me correct myself, lease of a new ambulance, new rescue. This is the first time the town has leased a vehicle and it's been vetted through finance and uh, Director Murray's been looking at it as well as Chief Stanley. This avoids us from having to put money to CIP and wait to get the vehicle we need where we would provide a lease payment. So there's two things you have to do, authorize the purchase of this vehicle and then authorize the lease of the vehicle. So. It's, it's about $340,000 as a two-year wait 
any of these vehicles, then you can't find them any cheaper. You can't get a used one. So this is really one of the only options, either that or you, you, you're really putting a tremendous amount of money in CIP. If you look at the lease, though, the way it works, this lease in particular, it, at the end of the lease, we own it. So, we, so really, it's, it's a balloon. <coughs> There's no balloon payment at the end. It's just this is the amount of money we would have to lease for, I'm not sure if it's five or six years, but I'll, the finance director's here. Five years, sorry. Um, I is a, so that's a G and H. I is a authorization of an award to uh, United States Services regarding portable restroom services, and that is from the uh, Director of Leisure Services who put that request in. All right. That's all I have. Any questions for members, for the manager? All right, seeing none, we'll take about a nine minute recess. Tell me where it is, I'll pick you up. I had, we had our sales party down. I probably told you the story. Um, and the first thing that she finished, um, and I'll keep saying it, and you probably don't even do it. The first thing that caught my eye was she was saying, Absolutely. <laughs> For the rest of the day, I was so I was petrified. So Is there an article manager? No. Um, no, it wasn't. Forty years ago, it was it was just crap. It was the crap that was going on. So the rest of the day was.
Thank you very much. I'm sure somebody had influence in that.
think she does. I think she does clothes and um, and then I think it's just that. It wouldn't matter, but it's okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. It is uh, Monday night, January 23rd, uh, around 7.30 p.m. for a regularly scheduled town council meeting. Our first order of business, as always, is the Pledge of the Flag. Next on the agenda here is the land acknowledgement statement, which I will read. The town of South Kingstown pays homage to the indigenous people and land on which the town is now located. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with an Aragansa tribe whose land and water we benefit from today. Next, we have the roll call. Council President McEntee. Here. Vice President Marin. Here. Councilwoman Bergner. Here. Councilwoman Alley. Here. Councilwoman Rose. Here. All members are present. Thank you. It's going to bring us to item four, approval of minutes of previous meetings. Motion to approve for A, B, and C. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. It's going to bring us to item five, the consent agenda. Motion to approve consent agenda. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. That's going to bring us to item six, licenses. 6A is a resolution granting a special events permit to the SK 300th Anniversary Steering Committee to hold the SK Incorporation Day bonfire at Saugatucket Park on Saturday, February 25, 2023 from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., application by Terry Murphy. Terry, welcome. Good evening. Uh, yes, this event was on the master list that was um, presented to the council back in the spring. It is the bonfire that's going to commemorate the incorporation day of the town of South Kingstown um, on February 25th in 1723. Um, the committee has planned to have the bonfire uh, to start at 6.30 p.m., Technically, because of we don't want to interfere with the church. St. Francis Church has a 4:30 mass, and we, we don't want to conflict with with the traffic. And there'll be food trucks. There'll be a, a DJ with some music playing and a very brief speaking ceremony. And the bonfire in the center of the park. We have consulted with the, the police chief, Union Fire District, and the fire marshal, um, as well as uh, Parks and Recreation staff will be on hand that evening. And the SKPT is also well aware of the event, so we'll be working with them for all the necessary safety precautions to take for that evening. Anybody has any questions? I think this is a great idea. I'm excited for it, but I just had an unrelated question. I was looking for the meeting minutes of your meetings, and I don't see where the agendas and the meeting minutes are posted on the website. Am I missing something? Uh, the agendas are posted on the Secretary of State's website, so they should be linked to every date. And um, I don't know how many of the meeting minutes have been uploaded to the Secretary of State's website, because I you know we have to do that by, by law. But those, um, we do have minutes, so I'll make sure those get updated and posted. Could, could you put them, or have someone put them on clerk base? Sure. Where, where I think 90% of the people would look like I'm looking and under other boards and commissions. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not there. Just I'll because. Yeah, absolutely. We're all trained to do that. Yep. Thank you. We'll do. Any other questions for Terry? All right. Well, we've known about this event for a little bit, so it's great to see this on the agenda here to get this going, and I'm sure it's going to be a great one, so I look forward to it. Thank you. But do I hear a motion on this item? Motion to approve item 6A. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right. That motion passes. It's going to bring us to 6B, a resolution granting victualing and holiday sales licenses to Cake Alicious LLC, doing business as Cake Alicious Bakery and Cafe of <coughs> Wakefield. Application by Lily Beth Rodriguez Vasquez. Lily Beth, if you're in the audience, I invite you to come on up. All right, she's not here. Uh, Jim, have you had any communication with the applicant? Uh, no, I have not, other than the uh, request. Okay. 
I mean, I'm familiar with the business. I'm comfortable granting this license. I believe they've taken over the operations of Sweet Cakes. So if, if any other council member. Well, normally, Susan Flynn tells us. Attendance that. was confirmed um, through our office clerk, so I'm not exactly sure. We hadn't heard anything else other than confirmed attendance. So if they are not granted this license tonight, does that affect their ability to operate within the next week and a half, two weeks, until our next meeting? Mike, Ursula? So I, I don't know when they were planning to open. I will say this as a guess. It may be the weather out tonight, which is why they're not present. But you do, if you want, have the ability to grant the license, even though the applicant's not here. But that's up to all of you. Hi, Nicole. So... <laughs> Standing in for Susan Flynn, doing a great job. Can you just are they are everything you need from the clerk's office available? So there's no um, hold up. Or sometimes we've, I think, approved it pending completion by the clerk type of thing. I just wanted to know if they have everything that Susan normally needs. As far as I'm aware, they do. Yes, um, I can definitely check and get back to you on that. But um, once. When, they, when these licenses get put up for approval, they're usually all set. All right, just personally, I find uh, no difficulty in approving this now to allow for no disruption in their business operations. So? I'll make a motion to approve 6B. Second. All right, we have a motion in a it's second. B. It's 6B. B. Yeah. I thought you said E. B. All right, we have a motion in a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. This time, for the sake of the interest in a group that has shown up for a certain item, I'm gonna move up item 12D, a resolution adopting a proclamation recognizing the week of February 1, 2023 to February 7, 2023 to be National Gun Violence Survivors Week in the town of South Kingstown to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence and uplift the resilient voices of survivors across the nation as shown in Exhibit 4, attached to your 2. And I do know that there's some speakers here who do wish to speak, so come on up. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. I wanted to um, say thank you to Chairman Rory and Councilwoman Patty and acknowledge the rest of the council and thank you for having us. So since I started writing this um, brief statement, um, the number of mass shootings this morning was 33 as of 2023. Right now it's up to 36. It's January 23rd and there have been 36 mass shootings in this year. The first week of February marks the time in the calendar year when gun deaths by violence in the United States surpasses gun deaths in other similar countries each year. It's five weeks. Most people die from guns by early February in the U.S. More people die from guns by early February in the U.S. than any other economically similar countries. I'm a volunteer for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in Rhode Island and have joined with 3,000 members in Rhode Island to raise awareness of gun violence and to advocate and pressure lawmakers to pass common sense gun laws. In 2022, in our state, 46 individuals died and 135 individuals were wounded. In South Kingstown, the SKPD annual report for 2020 identifies 13 weapon violations and no homicides. We are grateful to live in this peaceful town, but we understand that Rhode Island is a small state, that homicides solved and unsolved should be a concern to all of us. Gun violence has had an impact on my family. My husband's nephew, after suffering many years of depression, as a 52-year-old single man, took his own life. Never having owned a gun before, family has no idea where he obtained it, but he took his life and his father found him. The effects, the impact on that family and his many cousins was 
just huge. My cousin, my, my cousin Britta, 87-year-old cousin Britta in Colorado, um, she was in the supermarket shooting in Boulder, Colorado. She managed to be, in the, fortunately, in the back of the store, and, and um, employees escorted her and others to out the, the exit in the back, where they then went to another building and hid in the storage room. Her daughter and she are st still afraid, of course, for their, for their safety. Their death and escape has left our families experiencing survivor trauma that doesn't just go away. Mark's death had a devastating effect on his family and many cousins. Britta's close call left her and her daughter extremely afraid. America's culture of silence about gun violence means that we don't talk enough about or understand the lifetime impact on survivors. This proclamation amplifies the voices of survivors of gun violence to the citizens of South Kingstown. Your support shows that we stand with survivors and support an end to gun violence. And if you'd like more details and a great deal of data, text um, READY 64433 to get connected to every town and moms demand action. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jean. All right, do I hear a motion on this, Patty? Thank you, um, thank you so much, Jean, for all of your work and for all of the moms here tonight. I make a motion that the South Kingstown Town Council adopt a resolution in support of and declaring the week of February 1st to the 7th, 2023 as Gun Violence Survivors Week. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll just say that was very great words, Jean. Appreciate you coming up here, and thank you to the group for showing up tonight. It shows great support for it. Uh, any further discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. All right, this time that's gonna bring us back to item seven, public hearing. 7A is a public hearing relative to adoption of the proposed fiscal year 23-24 to fiscal year 28-29 capital improvement program, as shown on exhibit one attached to year two. <coughs> Now, at this time, I'll allow Jim Manny to give us a brief overview. I know we've sort of discussed this at length in previous meetings, but if you want to provide us with a, a general overview of what we've sort of looked into here. Yes, Council President. Um, the CIP uh, program is, is for, you know, obviously it's capital improvement program for the town, and it's for budgeting for expenditures that, uh, you know, most of them are pretty large, vehicles, projects, equipment, so forth, so on. <clears throat> when I presented the CIP uh, several weeks ago, I, uh, we had all the directors submit their list of uh, prioritizing what their requests were uh, to me. And I sat with the directors and with the uh, finance director, who's also in this room now, and if you have any specific questions, he could answer them. Uh, in more detail if, if I'm not giving them to you. And the directors presented about $3.5 million request in capital improvements uh, uh, items that they needed. Uh, I asked them to prioritize them even further than they did, and we narrowed that down to approximately $1.8 million, about half, in, um, in the uh, uh, capital improvement in my manager's budget is what I would submit. That number is very close to the number, the CIP number that from last year. It was, it was up about $90,000, which was a 5% increase, which to me was pretty low considering uh, all the inflation that we've had in the past uh, year or so. So I'm very confident in this, in this uh, request. Um, and we respectfully ask that town council uh, take a good look at it. And you know, this is a very lean, request by the directors and I went over every dollar of it and am satisfied that it, it is in the best interest of the town. And these are some priorities that we just have to fulfill. So once again, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if I can't, uh, 
the uh, finance directors here as well. All right, thank you, Jim. Any questions at this time for the manager? All right, seeing none, this is a public hearing, so I do invite anyone who wishes to speak on this item specifically to come on up. I'll just ask you to first identify yourself, and then we'll try to limit you to five minutes. So with that said, first come, first serve, come on up. All right. Up, oh, Doral, okay. I get enough that easy. Doral Beasley. Um, so, I saw the big dollar amount there for, uh, for schools. It was 163 million for this, under that six year little block, you know, six years projected. Um, so over the next few weeks, you're gonna be getting more information from the uh, school building committee and Studio at Jade about uh, what we're gonna be, about the, the choices you have in front of you as far as what we're gonna do for our schools. I'm here tonight to say that we can't go small. As a matter of fact, the 65, the, the bottom number, which was 65 million, that just kind of fixed the schools to keep them running, should be just, forget that number. Don't, I'm asking you not even to, to debate the number. Forget that number. And the next one up is 103. That was in the, the initial, um, that was the initial projection for a new high school from Studio J, but that came with a caveat that said that that wasn't um, a number that was up to date as far as the per square foot allowance that were, school districts in Mass uh, Rhode Island and in Massachusetts are seeing now is, is how much schools are actually costing. And Studio Jade has also said over a few, more than a few times, that it's more, in, it's, it's, it's costlier to renovate today than it is to build new. So, <clears throat> I'm hoping so the next number, when they, when they recalculated it, it came out to 123, 123 million. That would be for a new high school. It's not to the, the latest um, enrollment projection, which is a little lower than what that one was based on, but it's not too far off. But again, that doesn't do anything to the other, the other f uh, four schools that are gonna be still in operation in two years. So 123 is not enough. And remember, this is a one-shot deal from the state of Rhode Island that we have to buy into before the end of this year, or otherwise we lose the possibility of 52.5%. We cannot lose that. So, so the, the, the more things you can <clears throat> take off the table now, the more energy you can put into actually making the good decisions about what we should be doing. So I'm <clears throat> just saying to you that I'm hoping that when you start having these negotiations <clears throat> that you'll say to yourself, yeah, you know, that 65 and the 103 and the 123, it's not enough. Now, I know we're, I know the, the school the school committee voted to stay at uh, on Columbia Street, but here's 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 one. I'm bringing it up for this reason. Last year, the state, the, the legislator, legislature, and the governor signed legislation that could take and abandon 
municipal building and turn it into affordable housing. Now, I, don't, I haven't read the statute. I know, I know it was passed. <clears throat> we t we've talked about affordable housing in this town continuously, but we, we don't really ever do anything about it. Not really to create the, the low and moderate in income uh, places for people to live. For to me, why would we, so what I'm saying is why would we, if we stay at, on Columbia Street, what they're gonna do is they're gonna demolish either the whole thing, the entire structure, and build a new high school, or they're gonna demolish everything but the auditorium and the, the front building, the original building parallel to Columbia Street, but they're gonna gut everything. They're gonna go in there and like <clears throat> take all the insides out like you or I did. You're, all, you're past the five. Okay, I'll, I'll come back. If you... All right, anyone else in the audience wish to speak on this specific item? If so, I just invite you to come on up. Seeing none. All right, Doral, one last crack at this one. All right, so so if, if either of those two scenarios, what we're going to do is we're going to demolish either 100% of what we have there now, 240,000 square feet of building, or we're going to demolish 80% of it. Why would we do that? If, that, to me, that's the, mo that, that's the most valuable piece of property in this town right now for affordable housing. We should, do, we should get that, that property off the rolls, however you go about abandoning the structure, and then apply to the Rhode Island Housing Authority as one of the first places in Rhode Island to, 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 to change it into affordable housing. So what I'm asking the town council to do is before you make your final decisions about what's going on here, to have somebody look at the building and tell you how many affordable housing units you could put in there. Okay. Now, Okay, so what do we do then? The, t the school committee voted to stay there. Well, I do want to get you sort of on track. This yeah, I'm, 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 I'm back now. Okay, so, so I'm coming back to that now. So the school committee voted to stay there, and um, so then what do you do? Well, you go back to Curtis Corner. Yep, I think that's it. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wish to speak on the CIP? All right, seeing none. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, the public hearing is now closed. Do I hear a motion on 7A or any thoughts prior to making that motion? Go ahead. Just, it's just unfortunate that we had a lot of in-depth conversation three weeks ago about the CIP, and so it's almost like you want to tell people again there's some great things in there. I was looking just to highlight some of the things. One of the things is there's going to be a renovation to the Peace Dale Library where a small amount of money from the town, 80000 and we have a grant for the rest of this $300,000 project. They're going to renovate the balcony and expose some of the interesting architecture. Just trying to highlight a couple of great things that we really leverage some money with. There'll be some updates to the senior center in terms of blinds and um, carpeting that hasn't been done in a number of years. So there's a range of projects. I was just trying to find some feel good ones that people might, might feel good about where their money is being spent. Um, 
you know, obviously there's money dedicated to the parks and EMS, I think it's a new defibrillator in this year's budget, so there's a lot of things that really matter and make the community feel good and safe. So Jim really did make a lean budget, but while Dorald was speaking, and I apologize, Dorald, I was just trying to figure out what we could share since there's a lot of people here who might not have been here on the 5th. I'm excited for Old Mountain Fields and the facelift that that's gonna get. It's more than a facelift, it's gonna completely change um, how that area functions and when people come in, you know, we have the Waves team and we have a lot of people come in and when they come in from out of town to see those games, because I know they come from surrounding communities, it'll be so nice to, um, you know, show our best face for them for other communities. So I, I think you're right, there are a lot of great projects in there and if people have a chance to go through and look, it is really nice to see where your taxes are going. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, appreciate that. Any other thoughts from council members? All right, I'll just briefly state that um, you know, the purpose of the CIP is for us to be sort of financially prudent. It allows us to uh, plan out six years and uh, set out monies accordingly over time so that we can uh, make purchases or capital expenditures at the right moments in time based on uh, the useful lives of the assets we have in place. So it's a good plan, and I believe that Jim Manny has presented us with a lean CIP something that addresses the priorities of the residents, and uh, I'm pleased with what we have here, so happy to uh, approve this, but do I hear a motion on this item? Motion to approve item 7A. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. That's gonna bring us to item 8A. An email dated December 13, 2022 from Joseph DeSantis of Tri-County Community Action Agency requesting to present an overview of Tri-County programs, the impact of services on the town, and to briefly discuss Tri-County's tax exemption status. Now, I know Joe cannot be here tonight, but Jim, if you wanna give us a sort of brief overview about Tri-Community Action and the services they provide and what they're requesting here. Uh, yes, Council President. Uh, Mr. DeSantis called right before the meeting. Um, he had a... Uh, uh, he tested positive, he told us, and that he, he unfortunately could not come uh, to the meeting, but I think there's enough information here that the council can make a well-informed decision. So Mr. DeSantis is the president and CEO of Tri-County Community Action Agency. Um, <clears throat> his, even though he's the CEO, he's based here out of, uh, even though it's a big, it's out of Johnson, the headquarters, there's a big a facility here right across from Tony's Pizza that, that uh, complex there and they pay taxes uh, for, for years they pay taxes here this is a little complicated on, on how this discussion got to this point and the tax assessor is here and he can explain it in great detail but basically it comes down to this mr. DeSantis uh, explained what tri-county does it, it is uh, provides a, a multitude of services for low and moderate income households heating, food assistance, weatherization programs, Head Start and Early Start programs, employment and training to name a few. It has a very good reputation. It helps the underserved communities throughout the state. It's a, it's a really good agency. So several years ago, and I'll give you a brief overview. Several years ago, he was entered into a pilot program, payment in lieu of taxes, where there was an agreed amount that they would pay and it would not go up. <clears throat> the previous tax assessor made him tax exempt and there was a little confusion because the pilot was never signed by, uh, approved by the council, but even though it was proposed. But before I say too much, this is a subject matter expert right here, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Mark Capuano, our, our, our tax assessor. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, Mark Capuano, tax assessor. Um, as the town manager stated, um, there was a, a pilot agreement that went in front of the uh, town council uh, January 11, 2021. Um, after it was, uh, after it did go in front of the town council, um, then uh, several weeks later on July, on January 25th, um, an abatement was uh, put through. So basically what this did was uh, it just uh, eliminated uh, the remaining balance of the tax bill for Tri-County at that point. Um, so the, um, and then going forward, um, the abatement was, the uh, pilot agreement was gonna be in the amount of the remaining balance was about uh, $12,166. So um, when that did happen, um, the assessor's office 
switched the uh, land, what we call the land use code on the property from um, a non-exempt property to an exempt property. So the, um, what happened when that um, went through was uh, the upcoming two years, which was tax year uh, 2021 and 2022, uh, there was no bill that was issued for that property uh, based on it becoming an exempt property um, on our database. So uh, basically there's been um, no payments made because there's been no bill issued for the past two years. All right, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. So it's town staff's recommendation that we do approve uh, Joe's request here to make them a tax exempt permanently. Yes. yes. Got it. One thing I would add, Mr. DeSantis stated that of all the grants he gets, he cannot get any type of grant that would pay any type of property taxes. That's why this money comes directly out of his operating budget. Understood. Any questions from council members? I just had a question because I was on the council in 2021 and I. I don't really remember. I remember that we discussed several pilots, um, but I can't remember why one faded away. And I don't know if either one of you remember that. No, because we were on Zoom. So it was like- I remember talking about it. I don't- <laughs> We lived on Zoom that year. So um, yeah. I'm just trying to figure that out. And then if, are there other entities that are also tax exempt that have that same status in town? Um, I believe there are. I'm not sure how many, um, but it's not really the um, the organization that's exempt. The way that it was handled in the assessor's office, it was the building that was made exempt um, based on the ownership. Okay, so I'm, I'm concerned that are there other potential future ramifications from other agencies or entities that have property that we might be having them come forward in the same way? It, it's a good question. I think also you have to look at that. Um, the history was they were receiving grant funds that would offset their tax bill as well. From the town. Correct. So that was, there was a history there as well prior to that. Um, so I think that there may be other organizations that, you know, receiving grant funds now that it may be, have a similar effect to their, their tax bill. I'm not sure. But I, I think that's something that we'd have to consider when we looked at, you know, per se, other exempt entities in the town. What you're referring to, there are other pilots. There are other pilots between the town and organizations. That my, my recollection is small amounts of money, three, four, and five thousand dollars, not talking. This particular one, at the time you approved in 21, would have required them to pay $12,100, or basically one-third of their tax bill. Just prior to that, as Mark mentioned, we were giving them a grant for that, so it was like a wash. I don't know why, um, and Gene was the assessor, I believe at the time, why it went from a pilot status to a totally tax-exempt status, um, but it did, which is why tax bills didn't go out for two more years, and then when Mark came on, he's looking at these records and something's not adding up. Mm -hmm. So that's why on this particular one, we're here tonight saying probably should be tax exempt because we're not giving them a grant like we used to to offset the taxes. And um, in terms of the other pilots, you know, there, there are several very, you know, one, one's youth oriented, but there are some very different things going on out there. Um, I think one, was with an organization that doesn't even exist anymore, so. There's one other point to that. Up until last year, Tri-County was giving a grant back to the town for $11,000 for the senior center, but the state restructured that, and that money goes directly to the senior center. And it was initially cut by 18,000, then it was re reinstated with even more. So there's like this big shell game going on of the taxes being paid here, but grants being paid there, this just cleans up all of that. Yeah. This, this is on their building? They're the owner? Correct, yes. Yeah. All right. Do you, know, do you know where it is? It's on 108, yeah. okay. I'm certainly happy to approve this. I think this alleviates the prior history of giving them a grant, which they used to pay us in real estate taxes. So this just sort of is a moot thing that cleans that up, allows us to uh, appropriate different amounts to other outside service agencies. 
So I'm all for this. But any other thoughts or, or a motion on this? Motion to approve item 8A. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. So just to be clear, Mike, that action alone allows them to be tax exempt, their property that they own? It will, right, it's now gonna continue, and, and obviously if the property changes hands, this will be coming back before you. Understood. All right, that's gonna bring us to item 8B, a resolution dated January 3, 2023, adopted by the Exeter Town Council in opposition to legislative amendments proposed by the Rhode Island House of Representatives, Land Use Commission, Housing, Housing Working Land Group to address housing shortage and development issues. So we did talk about this quickly in the work session, um, and I want to share that I agree if you haven't had five minutes to read it. Um, I read through it this morning, and there's a lot in there. I, when I read through it, what I initially thought was that this kind of sets a terrible precedent for the town giving power to the state for, for lots of different things going forward. Um, so I would be hesitant to support that legislation. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to read it. Um, but Deb, I think you gave a pretty good summary if, if you don't mind doing that again for people who might not have heard the work session. Right, so um, for anyone who wasn't at the work session, there's a land use commission organized um, by the General Assembly and they are looking at um, changing the land use regulations. The town of Exeter has submitted um, a list of concerns and some feedback regarding that and just to read from their letter um, it says we believe that the recommendations from the land use commission would restrict existing municipal land use authority and could lead to a one-size-fits-all with statewide zoning um, what's happening now is this land use commission is going to provide some feedback it's going to then be submitted to the speaker of their house who will craft some legislation um, and so that legislation would then go forward into the House and the Senate. Um, and some of the concerns are that local control would be taken away and that what zoning regulations are good for any other city in town would be here um, applied. Um, for example, in, what, in Exeter, they're concerned with land use, water, farm and open space, and all of those things could change potentially they could do away with five acre zoning and if anyone lives in a five acre plot, you would know that you're choosing that because you have a certain lifestyle or that's how you want to live or choose to live. And so it's a concern that that would just all go away. Um, and also thinking about increasing housing increases density, which taxes infrastructure like water and sewer. And I was saying in the work session, we already hear from the community a lot in July, in June, July, and August when there's a water ban, and then we get the pushback, you continue to allow development, and we want the water to use as we choose. So we need to, as a council, either direct that our planning board turn around and quickly write a letter, because this legislation is gonna come out on February 16th, I believe, so we want to get ahead of this. We want to speak to our representatives and senators who can then advocate on our behalf as a town that we have concerns that this legislation is not good for South Kingstown. And I, I don't, I want to make it clear too, like I don't think that this means that we're anti-development or that, you know, because we do need um, some solutions to address affordable housing, but I think that that needs to stay with the town and I don't want the state telling us how we have to do that. This needs to stay with the municipalities. Agreed. So, if you, I, I know in, you, you hadn't read it earlier so I do hope that you no, do I, read it. No, I, I just hadn't printed it out but okay. I have read it. Okay, because I do think it's, we, we really need to speak with one voice that we need to add, that our town should decide how our town looks. We know our community best and we hear from farmers, we hear from people who love open space and all of these things come into play. And without you know, the understanding of what that means to what our town looks like, the character of our town would change in a way that we might not want, so. Agreed. We certainly know our town better than the state does mm -hmm. and we wanna maintain control of our planning and zoning with respect to housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
The decision making on that should rest with us and not be preempted by state action. So I'm happy to uh, get on board with uh, adopting the resolution here given to us by the Exeter Down Town Council in opposition. But do I hear a motion on this? Yeah. So if we adopt the resolution, can we also direct the planning board to, or do we want to, can we just draft a letter ourselves in support of? Yeah. Yes. Let's have the town clerk draft a letter on our behalf representing our opposition to these legislative amendments in conjunction yeah. with the Exeter Town Council and other towns doing the same. Do I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Right. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Thank you, Rory. I, I would like to, um, to give a, you know, some words of um, happy, happiness to the zoning department um, who I noticed in the cannabis um, requirements did indicate a need to follow like a coastal New England. I'm not exactly sure what the, the, uh, the words were, but like a coastal New England style. And also I'm pleased to see that in the, the Dollar General store that's been opened. Both I think are, are good examples of you know, what, what I'd like to see in the town. I do. I don't disagree with what either of you have said about this. Um, I'm a little concerned that it may be premature, based on receiving a resolution in the mail, um, asking us to adopt it, and not even listening to the other side um, on legislation that hasn't been introduced or written. Um, I, I think South Kingstown ought to make its own decisions with respect to zoning and housing. Um, but I think it's. I think it's premature to just say we're opposing legislation we haven't heard yet. Well, I think um, there's been some concern over the last few sessions at the State House that the state legislature wants to take action to sort of take away the town's ability over decision making with respect to planning and zoning and housing. And I think um, this represents sort of uh, the intention to get ahead of that and sort of represent that we don't want you, we don't want the state to take away the town's decision making with respect to that. And I think that's the intention of what the Exeter Town Council is, is writing here and requesting we get on board with. So from that intent perspective, I think I agree with it and I'd like to get ahead of it. I think as I stated, you know, our town, the towns know their makeup better than the state does, in my opinion. So that's sort of my perspective. I'm with you, Rory. I mean, one of the key lines is that the, these regs coming from the state could be in conflict with our comprehensive plan and so that trumps our comprehensive plan, which is our visionary document. So I'm with you, Rory. All right. Any further discussion? Uh, anyone opposed? All right. Let's take, let's take the roll. Okay. Council, <clears throat> Councilwoman Bergner? Aye. Council Vice President Marin? Nay. Council President McEntee? Aye. Councilwoman Alley? Aye. Councilwoman Rose? Aye. All right, Passes thank you. four to one. Thank you. All right, that's gonna move us to item C, an email dated January 4, 2023 from Tom Routliff of Broad Hill Residential Compound Homeowners Association relative to snow plowing private roads. Tom? Come on up. I do just want to announce, I know that there are a few others who have showed up with respect to this. Right. Uh, typically, what we do is we limit this item, uh, the speaking on this item, to the person who wrote the communication. And anyone else who wishes to speak, we invite you to come up during this segment for comments from interested citizens. But with that said, Tom, welcome. Okay, I want to thank the council for hearing us out. As you pointed out, I represent the Homeowners Association that has brought this petition to the council um, on the grounds that we feel the current snow plowing policy is unfair and particularly to taxpayers such as ourselves on private roads that are not being plowed by the town whereas other private roads are. I just wanna take a second to um, explain how we got involved in this. Over the years, this is a longstanding policy and over the years our residents would see town snow plows using our private road, which is the Broad Hill Way Road. And the plows would be up and they'd be going somewhere from 
ministerial road to the interior. We found out that they were in fact on their way to plow Sand Plains Road, which is also a private road. So that raised the question of why is Sand Plains a private road being plowed by the town? We took that question up with back then um, John Schock, and that's when we learned that there are in fact, and, and uh, Mr. Manny has the, uh, the numbers, but there's 14, um, 14 miles of private roads that are being plowed by the town, and uh, that's out of a total of 75. So roughly speaking, it's about 20% of the town's private roads, um, which are being plowed by free at taxpayers' expense, and we have an objection to that free ride. So going back to what John said, his explanation was that this was done by tradition. When we tried to probe into what does that really mean, um, there's, there's no written documentation for this arrangement. It does date back dozens of years, um, so we acknowledge that. But nevertheless, it stands as something that's very unfair to people like us living on private roads, and it's not just us. Again, there's 14 miles of these roads um, that are just not receiving the benefit that other people are. Um, and so with that, we are approaching the town council and requesting a change to the policy to make it fair. And again, it, it can be made complicated, but I think it's actually very simple. We're advocating for either not plowing private roads, period, and that would represent a little bit of a windfall for the town because right now, currently, you are plowing those roads, or conversely, to plow all the private roads. And, and again, we understand um, the consequences of that in terms of uh, the budget, et cetera. So again, I've been asked to keep my remarks brief, and, and that's about as brief as I can get them. Are there any other questions or any Mr. questions? Tom, we have there? I, don't, I don't have a question, but I, I do have some concerns um, with plowing private roads. Um, and I do, I have a little bit of personal knowledge <clears throat> when it comes to this. I live on a private road and my husband is a, a snowplow driver. <laughs> so um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is that um, private roads are not held to the same standard as town roads. Right. So when three inches of snow has fallen, plow drivers may not know what's underneath there and it could cause damage to town equipment. Um, another concern for me would be that um, a town vehicle might damage a private road and then who's responsible to repair that, right? Because we, I know on my road, if anything happens to the road, the residents are responsible for repairing the road, not the town. So those are just some things that come to mind. I, I also want to say I appreciate you coming up here with both options and realizing that, you know, it, it might work against you, um, if that's what we decide to do. But I think it's great that you have an open mind when you're, you're coming up to us to sure. discuss. If I understood your remarks correctly, though, um, actually by stopping the plowing, you would avoid those problems that you mentioned. Right, that's what I mean. So okay. I, I, mean, I, I personally would be in favor of and not plowing because if we did plow, those are the, the issues that I would see arising from it. Um, so that's why I want to say kudos to you for, for keeping an open mind when you come up and suggesting both options. Sure. Go ahead, Deb. So just wanted to make sure I understand all this yes. correctly. Yes. The town doesn't plow Broad Hill Way. That's correct. And there are other private roads that the town 40 years ago or 25 years ago may have had some handshake agreement to plow the roads. That's what we're doing, right? That's, that's correct. What, that, that's so what that is. I, I think it'd be, uh, if I gave you some statistics and some information, we've done a lot of research on this, it just might help you the conversation. Um, you, you'll have a lot more information to discuss. Um, I met with Mr. Routliff uh, several times in his uh, contingent, and they came with that concern that he spoke about. We started this conversation in the fall. So. Let me give you some statistics on uh, the magnitude of the number of roads and miles that we have in this town. So first off, the total number of roads in this town 
are 827. That's 302 miles of roadway in the town of South Kingston. The total town roads are 453. That's 149 miles of roads of the 302, right? So about half, 55%. So once again, 827 roads in the town, 302 miles. The town roads are 453 roads, 149 miles of that. The total private roads in this town are 336, 75 miles of roadway. That's about 40% of the total number. The total number of state and URI roads is 38 roads, but that's about 78 miles. So let's break it down even further. So of the private roads, the 75 miles of roads that are private in this town, plowed and graded by the town. So not only are they plowed, we send graders out because there's some, most of them are dirt roads, is about 10 miles of that 75. Plowed only by the town is about 3.7 miles. And graded only by the town is a small amount, about 0.2 miles. No town maintenance on, any, on the private roads is 61 miles. So those numbers again, private roads is about 75 miles. The town does not do any grading or plowing on 61 of the miles of those roads. So as Mr. Routliff stated, it's about 13 and a half miles, 14 miles if you round up, of the number of roads that are plowed and or maintained mm -hmm. by the town. As you stated, there's really three options. You include all roads to be plowed in the town, all private roads and town roads, which uh, would be about five to six FTEs, full-time employees required maybe upwards of 10, because we have 22 people on the road for any given snowstorm, we, we might have to go to at least 30, so it could be anywhere from six to 10. And six additional, ve uh, uh, correct myself, three additional vehicles. Each one would depend on the truck that was picked, could be a $190,000 dump truck or an $80,000 plow truck, a smaller truck. So you're still talking a substantial investment. The, the immediate capital investment would be about $500,000. The next option is eliminate all the roads and uh, all the town roads that are currently being plowed. And the third option is leave as is. So the, this town, we have not, and we could date back 29 years, that's the longest employee in DPW that could give us an answer nor could we find out how any of these private roads, how any of these were included in plowing. So the employee with 29 years, who's a supervisor there, said in his time frame, no new town roads were added to the list that were being maintained. And we could not find any type of agreement with any type of owners on these private roads going back, whatever they are, 40, 50, 60 years. This town was a different place back then. It was a much smaller town, and, and I'm sure a lot of these things were done by handshakes. Uh, but you know, this, at some point, a decision was made by someone in this town that whenever these new developments were going in, many of them would be private roads that do not meet the standards uh, that the town roads have that are owned. Um, for example, drainage, curbs, thickness of the asphalt. So you are correct that they are different standards. Some are very poor condition to begin with. So that's really, uh, that's the breakdown I have for you and, and uh, that's all the statistics I have. So sorry to interrupt you. And if I might just summarize also just before I sit down. So there's the 75 total private roads in town of which about 64 are not plowed, but there's 14, these are by miles, by miles. 14 miles of private roads are being plowed for free. And so the concern and the grief that we have is that the people that are living on those 14 miles of road are getting a free ride and have for a long time. And it's unfair to the taxpayers of SK and for people like us who do live on 
private roads where we're incurring the snow plowing costs and yet our neighbors, in our case, are not. That's the essence of, of our concern. So I'm inclined to eliminate um, plowing and grading of private roads. However, we're in the middle of winter and I wanna make sure that if we decide to do that, that pe those people who have typically been relying on the town to plow have ample notice to make arrangements. I mean, if we just say, yep, we're gonna vote on this and it happens tonight and we get a storm tomorrow or in two days, they're gonna have, you know, th I think we need to, if we're gonna do this, we need to give written notice that as of, you know, this date, um, <clears throat> after an audit of, of plowing our, services. Our, su our suggestion on that was to, if it's voted in favor of, of eliminating it, to provide notice now and then make it effective start of the next season, which roughly gives people nine months, you know, the entire summer to line up alternatives. Yeah, I think because I do think at this time of the year, most most people who plow are, are booked, their accounts are full. Yep. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's a great compromise. I, I kind of, I'm sad I, I won't get my road plowed, <laughs> but. <laughs> I, I feel like we're not gonna be able to financially plow all the private yeah. roads, and so I, I think it is kind of an interesting thing that you point out, and I think it's something that we should look at, and I agree with Jess, having some lead time for people to make other arrangements I think is fair. I think some of these private roads that I know of, they're in all sorts of states of conditions and things like that, so I wouldn't want, I just want to try to back away from that. I'm really curious how we started grading other private roads. I mean, it's, it's, it's concerning to me that we're doing that for some and not for others, and it, 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 the have and the have nots. I also think that perhaps at, if we do notice will be doing this. Um, if we could put information in with that as to how to request to have your road accepted by the town, um, because there are certain standards it has to meet, maybe some people will want to do that. Um, but I think at le we could at least give them the information. So a few questions. Oh, one second. Uh, Jim, with respect to, I know the concerns about uh, the subsidize, like the taxpayers are subsidizing some roads at the exception of other private roads. Now I wanna ask you, Jim, what is the financial figure we can attach to the 14 miles of, plow of plowing that the town does? Well, I, I have not been able to calculate that yet. It's gonna be a cost per mile uh, depending, you know, but what I have is, um, I, I don't have an exact number right now. I would have to get that for you. We, we've extrapolated and, you know, just from our own experience, <coughs> We've been plowing uh, roads that amount to about two and a half miles, and we figured in very round numbers, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably 200. But Jim, that's just extrapolating from our experience. Last year, and I know so far this season, it's an anomaly, but last year, which was not particularly bad, we spent for our development about $10,000. That's for about two and a half miles, not quite that, so. For private plowing. For private plowing, yeah. And, and that also includes sanding, I'll say. So no, no road maintenance. That's plowing and sanding and salting. So 10,000, two miles, as a, 14 miles is? Extrapolating, yeah. So how many so, miles in your homeowner association? Two and a half. Two and a half? 10,000? Yeah. Do the math. Last year. Right. Again, weather's a very- You time that by six, what, 60,000? to subsidize these 14 miles of private roads for plowing? Yeah. Again, it depends because it's, you get the number of roads as opposed to one long road. It's probably more than that because you got to drive. I think it would be more than that. Because they're not efficiently located. So it's. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. This is really important. Thank you. I agree. I, was, I agree. Thank you, Tom. Two more sure. questions. Uh, like, want to ask you a few sort of legal questions. There's no legal barriers that bar us from any of these options here. This is purely a policy decision. Um, I actually did, of course, do some work prior to the meeting, knowing this was coming up. It, it's really not a legal issue. If the town wanted to keep um, the present system in place, it could. 
Um, it's not the greatest analogy. It's almost like you know zoning when you make a zone change, people are grandfathered in. At some point, um, back in the seven, my, my guess is, and this is from my memory and having conversations with John Schock back in the 90s, because this has come up from time to time, um, John believed the policy went back into the 70s and the late 60s when the town was extremely rural. There weren't as, nowhere near as many residents. And as new developments came along, the town simply did it. At some point, someone, it wasn't John, made a decision that that was getting too expensive, and they said no more going forward. So as the manager mentioned, we know for at least 29 years, no one's been added. My guess is it probably goes back further, but you know, that's, that's kind of a guess. But um, whether you um, leave things as is, stop the plowing, or obviously do it for everyone. I live on a private road, that would be nice. Uh, it's not a legal issue, it really is a policy issue because at some point there was either a handshake or a written agreement that the town would do that. We can't find records, but there must have been something back then. So. Yeah, it, you know, could very well be, which is why we don't plow roads today unless you bring them up to um, subdivision standards. So, yeah, of, of course there could be. Mm -hmm. Any damage caused by a town-operated vehicle, we are liable for that on any road. Right. And, but, but I will tell you this, God forbid if um, a, a snow plow driver, if someone was injured while on a private road, the town's insurance would still cover cover that for that employee. It would not cover the damage to the private road. But. I personally have a little concern over the reliance aspect of this. You have 14 miles of roads here, of private roads that have had a history of being plowed by the town and presumably those, those homeowners expect that, relied on that, and uh, you know have sort of set their finances in according to that. Um, I just have a little hesitancy to just sort of move away from, you know, th what we've had in place over the last few years for the sake of sixty thousand dollars, which we just quantified here. I think and that's. I, I think it's, that's it's a real ballpark number. I, but I think that it's going to be a big, a bigger difference because it's, we're going to need manpower to if we expand. Like, you want to keep it just the way it is. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that uh, the reliance aspect is something that is important here. I think uh, these homeowners have sort of relied on this for, I guess, over 30 years at this point. And I think that there's you know, a lot more potentially people affected by a potential change that are not here, not really aware that we're considering sort of pulling that on them. And I think, uh, I just don't think the financial burden, I know you have concerns about taxpayers subsidizing uh, some private roads at the expense of others who are excluded but I just don't see the big burden taken here. But the flip side of that is that's regarding the 14 roads. By, this, by that logic, then it wouldn't cost that much more money for the town to plow all the private roads. We're looking for equity here. Mm -hmm. I understand you're looking for equity. So I'm I, no, and just one other thing, in terms, in terms of the effect on those people, if you did stop plowing, you could consider establishing fair market value for that service and then surcharging them for that. Again, that would provide some level of fairness right. across it. Because just to stand there and say, this is a longstanding but very unfair policy, we're not gonna change it, just is really hard right. for us to. All right, along those lines of thinking, Jim, I have a question for you. If we decided to take that route, continue to do the plowing, but charge them, so we'll give them notice that even though they've received, I guess, free plowing from the town over the last number of years, the council has decided that we now are gonna charge you for these. That at least doesn't take away the service, but it informs them that they're gonna be charged for it. Is that something we could potentially do? Well, the standard of fair and equitable, we'd have to offer that to everyone, I guess, then. Right, you open the other. You know, um, I live on a private road as well, and it's-, it's We're not plowing your road. No, I know. <laughs> so, I, so I guess it would essentially- <laughs> Essentially, but it, I think that if, if we do offer that, we'd have to offer it. It would essentially be this. The town council has decided to uh, no longer
plow these private roads, but in lieu of that, we will offer to do it to you, for you for a fee. So it no longer takes away the, the actual service, but now they have to pay for it. Then what happens then, Roy, when everybody here comes, wants to do it? Right here comes, and then we have we don't have the staff to do it. Right, we have to then hire additional staff. It becomes then be more of an expense for us. Mm -hmm. than especially if the roads aren't up to standard. Right, and we're looking at damage that could happen to our our town equipment. Right. Do you, do you so then here comes Tom's a homeowners association, and they say, "Oh, we would like that deal too." We have. And then you're going to get people saying, right. well, can you I'll do my driveway? Like, right, right. You know? so, you, I think if you go the other way, everyone's going to want the town and, because then they don't have to contract every year. They can just go, we just pay the town. The ta we just, the town bills us. So it creates more of a problem. Then you have the staff that Jim's saying, you can have all those employees and then you're going to need to buy equipment. I, 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 feel, I feel like Jess is saying, I think that they, they have benefited um, although I, I kind of really think I need the list of the 13 miles of the town roads. What what roads are we talking about? Because maybe I don't think of it as a pl as a private road. Yeah. The, you have 78 different roads. Oh, 78. Yeah. What what are the most? The, we, we I mean, there is a list, and we, we were given. Them. Well, I think just looking, you know, I don't have the complete have list, list in front of me, but we do have a complete list. Or Broadhill, the road they're on, is probably one of the biggest ones. So it's 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 a fairly good sized development. Right. Are there others like that? So like is like Big Bear Road off Tuckertown, is that a private road? I don't have the list, but there's seventy eight roads obviously from the number of fourteen miles, some very small. Um Van Plans is pretty low. It's a long road, yeah. That's a private road? Yeah. It is being plowed. So I do, I, do, I do think we need equity, and I do think to, to rely on the fact that, oh, this was a policy along so anything. There was lots of things that we are embarrassed as a country that we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that we shouldn't just say, just because we did it then, we should keep doing it. So I, I feel like these taxpayers feel po pointing out inequity, and I think I value equity, so. Uh, Mr. President, one other thing, some of, probably most of these private roads do not have homeowner associations. So to get any group of people agree on one thing, I think would be very difficult anyway. Suppose you have 20 people on a road and 15 want it plowed by the town and five are saying, no, we don't want to pay. Um, so I think that that option would be a tough one to uh, implement. So I will make a motion to direct town staff to discontinue plowing and grading private roads and to also notice those residents um, that those services will be discontinued as of, November. shall we say, Second. September 2023. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. It's going to bring us to item D, an email dated January 12, 2023. That did want to speak on this topic. Yes, and I preface this item uh, by stating that uh, we do limit communication on the item to the person who wrote the communication, but anyone else who wishes to speak on it, we allow them to come up from the segment on comments from interested citizens. So if we just hang tight for a little bit. All right, it's going to bring us to Jim. Just to tie this off, can you get us that list, um, the list of the roads? Yes. Because we've now just made a decision that those roads are now out. Um, we want to make sure that they, I'd like to see what the notice is and what um, roads are going to be involved. Yes, by Friday, I'll give you the list of 78 roads, and, uh, and we, we will use the date of September 1st to uh, put them on notice. All right, item 8D is an email dated January 12, 2023 from Joanne Esposito, tendering her resignation from the Economic Development Committee, effective immediately. Make a motion to accept Joanne Esposito's resignation and direct the town clerk to thank her for her service. Second. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. It's gonna bring us to item E, an email dated January 18, 2023 from Council President Rory McEntee requesting an opportunity for William Green of URI to present his study on mixed use zoning in South Kingstown's commercial highway districts. William Green, at this time, I invite you to come on up. Yeah, I have that. All I have to do is, I just feel like I brought in stuff from my computer. Yeah. Does this, do I have to do it here? Where else can I do it? Hmm? I know, it's like, I don't know how Susan, ah, oh, there we go. Better? Yeah, I guess so. It works. All right. Thank you, William. Thank you for coming, and uh, we're excited to see what you have for us here tonight. All right. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? I have to see this a little bit. Um, so I'm Will Green. I'm a professor of landscape architecture at URI. I'm a registered landscape architect in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I practice landscape architecture for 40 plus years. Um, I joined the faculty in 1990. Um, this is my background. Sure. Yep. I joined faculty in, in 1992 and have served the department for 30 years. Uh, was the chair of the department for 15 years. I'm no longer chair. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, prior to, to joining URI, I practiced landscape architecture in the Boston area, and I worked for architecture firms, landscape architecture firms, and was a, an employee in BHP Engineering. So I have a, a pretty well-rounded background. And so coming to URI was a pleasure for me, and I, I feel like I was the right person for the job at the right time. Um, this is a, an aerial view of your town and my town. And the topic is partnering with municipalities to shape a more sustainable future. And it's, um, and so I have a number of slides that I'm going to go through. But this is what I'd like to do in the time that I have, and I'm not exactly sure how much time, but you may have to throw things at me to, to get me off. But um, I'm gonna talk about LAR studio partnerships that I have been carried, carrying out for 30 years with cities and towns from around the state. Um, I'm going to tell you what they are, what they do, and I'm going to focus on two projects from the same intersection, which is Dale Carlia Corners. And I hope, I, I actually have some discussion um, leaders, if I want, or, or 
at the end of this, if there's time, just to go into perhaps how to do what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's, it's important to know that this is work that students have prepared. It's not a professional firm, but it is a carried out like this, this um, visualization here was done last year. It's also, some of you may know, if you, if you go hang gliding <coughs> over Peacedale, you'll see that the, that's um, down in Peacedale, and one of our we were working on a project along the river um, last fall. Uh, Landscape Architecture 444, the, it's a sustainable design studio, but it's a service learning studio. So I've been doing service learning with students for 30 years, and for, it, service learning is we work for, for clients on real projects. Students get trained, or they get skills in, in what it's like to be a professional, and communities get services. They're not professional services. They're not shovel in the ground and you're ready to go. These are visualizations and ideas, but they, in most cases, they lead to other phases of projects related to the, the particular project that my students work on. These are six projects that I worked on with my senior studio, and typically it's a senior class with two to three uh, graduate students from the Masters of Environmental Science and Management or the Marine Affairs program, depending upon if we're working on the coast or if we're working inland. Um, the two that I want to focus on are the ones that come up in red, Dale Carlia Corners in 2012 and the village, um, the village scale um, mixed use development for Dale Carlia Corners, Route 108 and um, Old Tower Hill Road. Um, we're all, I won't say we're all, but many of you are familiar with this sort of area. I think every one of us goes through that intersection at one time or another, uh, almost every day. Uh, it's important to know that Wakefield, this particular location is, is, it's pivotal. It's a pivotal location. You've got the crossroads for going to Peacedale and points north, you've got you can go to Narragansett, you can go um, in a westerly direction that will take you to the old village of um, Wakefield. And also on this, I don't know if I'm gonna do it, I'll do it with one of these. Um, let's see, there. So you've got Route 1, which is an important connector. You've got the, the roadway, Route 108, that moves toward Narragansett and then going north. Then you have these other properties. Right out of our screen is Old Mountain Field. We know that the bike trail comes right through here and it heads, it heads north. Oh, you can't really see my, my um, cursor very much. So, um, so it's, you're centrally located. And then if you want to go to Boston, New York, or, or any place else, you can also get there from that bike trail. So everything comes through this point, this place in Wakefield. In 2012, I was, I was approached by Vin Murray, um, and he, he asked if I'd be interested in doing a project looking at Dale Carlia Corners, the difficulties in people crossing the street or biking through the intersection, um, what to do with parking lots of, a lot of pavement, few cars, no trees, and a lot of runoff, and if there were things you could do with sidewalks and buildings, um, and I thought it was, a, it was a wonderful project for students. So I, I accepted the project, and um, then seven years later, in 2019, I was asked to come to the same location, except that the, to change my emphasis and look at Old Tower Hill Road, and now look at the developments in the Wakefield Mall, look at look at the strip malls along the roadways and say, is there a way that we could have mixed use development whereby we could clean up what the, the um, environment looks like there, provide housing, make it safer for people, and perhaps encourage commercial development as well, and make it 
perhaps even have a, a, a strong linkage with the older section of town and make them perhaps even look somewhat similar. So I took both of those projects on and, um, and I always start a project with existing conditions. You, get, you inventory your site, you find out what's there, and you start to analyze it and say, what should, um, what's going on there? So I happen to have just touched that one. Uh, you're looking at different locations. That's not the same site. That's six different sites, just so that you know. Um, and you can look, the, the left side, you're looking at Route 108. You're looking um, in two different directions. You're looking at the Wakefield Liquor site. You're looking at another site um, across from, I think it's across from Covadis. And then you're looking down uh, towards Wakefield Village um, westerly on the top right, and you're also looking at, out at Ocean State Job Lot. Um, there are a lot of similarities in those pictures. There's a lot of gray, black um, ground cover, which is called pavement, and there's there's very little um, there's not little continuity between architecture. There's a lot missing. And so it's a, it's a great project for students to be able to say, what could we do in, in a place like this? Um, in 2012, um, Feet First was, was vacant, but the others were not. Chen's, I think, was still in business, uh, but maybe they went out, but they've already been replaced twice over there. Uh, Clark Farms is not there. Um, uh, Bobby G's is closed now. Um, so there, there's all this movement that goes on in the town and the question is what can you do? How can you do it quickly and effectively? And so in my studio, um, we continue not only looking at buildings and places, but then we say, so what do they mean? So this is three images that the class in 2012 looked at and they said, oh, that looks like it's Ocean State job lot and um, marine, uh, the marine uh, supply place. And um, it just says that there is, you can't read it. Pervious. Now, this is not the entire watershed. We know that we have forests and there are wetlands. Uh, but what I will say is that if you're looking at cause and effect, there's usually a figure that says 10% of cover and you're just at the threshold of beginning to start to affect your water, your surface water supply. Uh, we're um, in a situation where if you look we have 27.4% vegetation in the area that's outlined in the top right, the green, um, or that one. That's the project site that my students are working on. Well, 27.4% with most of it on the side or behind yeah. uh, shores is not a lot of green. And then if you look in the bottom on the right, it says 72.6% is, is impervious. And that just tells you that we have when it rains, and if it rains heavily, we get a lot of water that rushes off of that pavement and it goes somewhere. Um, and the students need to develop that knowledge, the skill of doing this, and also the knowledge to be able to, to say, what, did, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, and I'm not going through a complete analysis. <laughs> There's this one thing on, that deals with an issue that is very important to every town um, that has development. From the analysis phase, every project, and these are two projects and four pictures, uh, the left side are, I require students to run a public workshop. So they do meet people, stakeholders, they learn to talk to people, and they learn to listen to people. Um, we see you, Tom. 
<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I would have X'd out the people. I, <laughs> I think Maria's on one of those too. <laughs> um, or she was. Um, and then the two images on the right side are final presentations. So the students get a reality, um, I won't say a reality check, they get a sense of what's, what it's like to be a practicing professional designer. And, um, and it helps very much um, by providing this service to your community and other communities. So this is a master plan that was prepared in 2012 and one of those started with the work session and then the students developed themes and they went forward. And in, in 2012, it's not the same as 2022. Ten years later, we are reading about storms, water, fire, I mean, it's, it's crazy. But the world, we knew about storm water in 2012. But we hear about it all the time now, and it's hard to ignore. So in this case, it just says, what are we looking to do? Complete streets is the way it was at the time it was read through programs and not through programs. And we just said, make streets Houston as a community recognize that the street is not just a car. The street supports people for habitat, for water, for walking, yeah. pedestrians. And so complete streets were one of the big things and the goal was green connections. We were trying to say, so how do you connect from Dale Carlia or from Wakefield to get to Shaw's or to get Will, to the bowling alley? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Could you speak into the microphone and sort of address the council? I want to make sure people watching at home pick up on everything you're saying here. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so anyway, what we're, we're looking right now at a, at a 10 year old project where the students are looking at increasing bus transit. If we want to get people into the center of town, they either have to drive, which is what they do now, or we need to be able to provide easier access by other means. So strengthen public transportation, uh, calm vehicular traffic so it's easier to walk or bike. I'm sure that Parents with young children do not go uh, very often anyway, biking or even walking on the street. You can't carry on a conversation on Route 108. Um, anyway, that's what the students, the students came up with this list of things that they could do. And then the design on the right actually starts to say, oh, we, we are doing that. And in, so that's 10 years ago and they're already making recommendations to Pull buildings, I don't know if you're going to see this. No, it gets, it gets lost there. Um, <laughs> I stay here. Uh, to bring buildings that exist, to pull them up to, to the edge of the street so that you can start to create a physical corridor and an edge to the traveling, traveled way. And so they're doing edges, they're looking at expanding sidewalks, finding places to sit, they even, they're talking about bump outs, but they're not showing bump outs. I came a few uh, in 2016 in another studio in town. Um, but anyway, that's their um, initial master plan. And then students illustrate what they want things to look like so people can get a better idea. It's a communication t tool. So on the right, it's like a complete street. You've got biking, you've got pedestrians, you've got curbs, you've got an, a central um, boulevard um, design motif where it's it, being used for stormwater collection and it creates a screen and it slows traffic down. And I think um, there's a section on the top that just shows where the bikes are, where the trees are and, and the, um, the distances. Uh, this is another um, image where by the Boaters World was turned into a health and fitness center that was connected um, through walks to get over to O Mountain Field and to be able to, to jog and, and walk into the woods in the back. And so the students are talking about, again, pulling a building to the edge of the pavement, now, or to the street. Now, I don't tell students to go in and 
take down buildings and houses that it's- uh, Will, can you just speak into the microphone? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you again. <laughs> can't, can't take the professor out of the guy. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't tell students that they have to take down buildings to give them, to give people a nice place. We normally will look at what the life, the expected life of a building is, where the, where the building is in terms of the number of years of an expected life before it needs to be renovated or updated. And usually we, we, we talk about phasing projects so that you don't come down and knock out an entire uh, street or neighborhood at one time. So in any case, building has pieces uh, that become common in design schools and in design firms in, in, at, at this moment in time, even with signage, with smart uh, bus shelters, uh, looking, looking at ways of enlivening the street, which is in many cases um, simple to do and, and much appreciated, like um, the painting company that always has their murals on Route 108. I mean, I don't know, six times a year, you walk by, you drive by, walk by, bike by, and you wanna know what's the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it can be done. This, these are luminaires in the pavement on the crosswalk and also just saying, should a um, substation be an eyesore all of the time or is there a way that with some creative thinking that you can spruce it up and make it something that is not just a liability. Um, anyway, that, that, was seven, that was in 2012, and this is 2019. I show this one uh, because there's a lot going on here. The graphics have changed also. Um, it's a village center plan, 2019, and the group that starts, starts out is after they meet with people and after they do analysis, they say, so what are we looking for? We're looking to find out what are the opportunities that, that are there on the streets and on the properties. And so they say, safe walkable streets, sidewalks, amenities, reducing pavement. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. New roads, housing, commercial development, because I wanna talk about the, difficult, the challenges in having a mixed use development in an area like this. And then in looking at natural conditions, erosion and drainage, the need for green infrastructure today, uh, and stormwater management, protecting and restoring natural areas and corridors, increased biodiversity. That's a topic that um, the world is, is saying that it's the unspoken big issue of our time. Um, and then there's a social issue that just says safe streets, improved human scale development, affordable housing another housing thing. Okay, so this is what the students are, were doing in 2019, and this is looking down, no one looks down except for architects and landscape architects and planners, um, but that's Quo Vadis on the left, and the one across the street that is, I'll call it Almy's, so I can sound like a true Rhode Islander, um, but it's really the post office. and. Um, and the students come up with an idea that says we're going to, does the post office need to have super commercial real estate when it's, when it could be located almost anywhere? Um, and so one student is talking about we're going to have green roofs on a, new, uh, on a building that is moved. Then he calls the development the post, so it's commercial with um, housing, and then there's new parking, there's new housing in the back because they do a parking lot and green spaces. Um, and then there are just some images, I'm not going to, I'm not going to explain them, but there's sections where you just see, oh, there is a green roof and it looks like there are people on the roof. Um, not all green roofs uh, are suitable for having people on the top. Uh, the village market is Looking, looking over um, at Belmont's parking area, uh, Belmont is a great uh, grocery store to visit. Its parking lot is just like every other parking lot in town here. It's, it's gray and it's got a lot of runoff pavement and no trees. And um, so the students look at that, they come up with an idea and say, well, let's, let's put trees in the parking lot. 
Now, I don't normally say to develop to to commercial to commercial developers um, get rid of eight or ten parking spaces for trees, but I think there's a, a there's a change in dialogue that's occurring that is suggesting that cities and towns don't really need to have required off street parking for every project, and. Um, and I think uh, if that's what's going on, I know that um, I think it's Hartford um, has adopted uh, that as a, um, as a parking, it's not a parking requirement. Uh, I think that we should be thinking about creating environments that are cooler, shaded, have, have habitat value or at least insect value that also because they're living, that means that they can infiltrate stormwater so that we can direct, we can grade parking lots so that the water runs to the trees and it sinks and gets absorbed in the ground. So these are, these are ideas for increased bioretention. Green roofs also are used for as green infrastructure. Um, and then this is another before and after. This is over at... Um, Wakefield Liquor and the, um, the bank. And ag once again, the students are saying, if we are going to create street, slow traffic, get people on sidewalks, we have to make the street habitable in a way. So they pull, the, pull buildings closer to the street. I'm a little surprised that they were pulling CVS close to the street, uh, <laughs> but they did. And I'm just here, I'm, I, I, it's a, uh, I'm just like saying, I'm presenting student work. Um, but the Village Square has a, a number of positive pieces to it. It's increasing green space. It's got, it, it's maintaining the memorial um, at the corner. And then it's pulling um, new housing onto the, by the street and creating, taking parking and getting it out of our faces as we drive by and having a nicer front. Um, this, is a, this is a view of the village square looking up Route 108. It's the lower picture, it's a, it's, it's a perspective. Um, and I'm just showing that because you can see small things, small things make small impacts. But if you were to have more of a green roof, more of green infrastructure, more of people walking, more of people biking, feeling comfortable doing that, uh, you create a sense of a community, and that's what this project has been trying to do. Uh, they're looking at the, the memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, uh, from, uh, I guess it's from Route 108. Um, I had to throw these in there because they spent all this time working on this, uh, and that's looking from the other direction. Um, and then this is a big one. And this is the mall up there. Um, and I wanted to show what's, what one student envisioned for, a possibil for the possibility. That's looking at the location of where Shaw's was. He's not getting rid of Shaw's. He's basically creating a structure that has Shaw's and it has a rooftop where people can live it's got shops, it's got a parking garage beneath the structure, it's got a Ripta station out there uh, in front, it's got a green space, and it's got a lot of trees. This is the uh, aerial view, and uh, you can see poking out underneath is a parking garage. Um, these are things that aren't gonna happen quickly, but there's housing in here, and um, what makes this project interesting besides the fact that I, I know that this one person I think was working 76 hours uh, a week on this for I don't know how long, um, is he made these images of what the roof would look like, hanging out on the roof on top of Shaw's so you could go down and buy a tomato and then go back up and hang out there. And um, he ended up with so what, do, what, am I, what am I asking for them to endorse? Nine duplexes, 18 residential units, two bedrooms, and they calculated revenue. I'm not sure how, but it's taxes. 
And then they said 176 apartment units, 81, 88 one bedroom, 88 two bedroom, and that's potentially a half a million dollars of revenue. Um, and then it talks about the other add, added, added uh, value, 937,000 square feet of additional green space, uh, over 21 acres, 363,000 runoff, a cubic feet of runoff collected and repurposed or treated or directed to, to where it needs to go to be filtered and uh, infiltrated. And then you've got 95,000 uh, square feet of green roofs, also green infrastructure, good for the neighborhood, good for the birds and the bees, and 15,000 linear feet of additional bike lanes. Um, I have others, I'm not gonna go through them, I think I've spoken enough. Um, I have two other, two other projects to show, but I, I'm not going to, because I think I make my point. I think that um, this past semester, my class worked in, um, in Galilee, on the waterfront, uh, on the port, and on uh, mixed-use development for the village of Galilee. So it's a timely subject. And I know that Galilee has a, they have a, an, a, an overlay district, a special, special use overlay district that allows for mixed-use development. It doesn't mean that it's happening, and it doesn't mean <coughs> that, it, that all of the regulations are enforced. But I, I understand also that Middleborough has a pretty strong um, zoning overlay as well. And it just seems overlays are not the only way to go. You can expand uses. COVID brought out the need for us to have our children or our grandchildren or our grandparents moving into our homes. And we need more, more housing uh, that can be provided on single lots. And there are different ways that the town can probably um, in engage with that. Uh, let's see, how can I move? I'm not going to move. Um, I think that's all I want to, I, I had to say. I'm more than um, happy to, to respond to any questions or comments that you might have. If I can help and answer something for you, I will. Um, I think that you've got a real opportunity here because You've got, you've got something to look at just a mile up the road, and there are precedents in the, uh, around that you can find where people, where there are three-story, four-story mixed-use developments, and people gravitate to them. The challenge is finding them, finding a way to get everyone together, and to nod together that it's got benefits for everyone, and, um, yeah. All right, thank you, Will. Definitely impressive work by your students there. I think this type of thing does pose opportunities for this town to take advantage of our interest in increasing the supply of affordable housing, which is certainly a priority for this council. Um, are there any questions for Will while we have him here? Go ahead. Um, am I correct that part of your students' work um, a few years ago was to do a survey of the business owners in the downtown area? Um, hmm. they, they are not skilled surveyors. Um, they, may, they may have. Typically at a public workshop, the students have, they prepare a survey for um, participants coming in and they will, they will spread them out um, in town, just trying to get as much feedback from users owners uh, and just citizens who are willing to talk about that. Um, but there, I'd, I'd have to look at that. Okay. I'd, I'd be curious if, if the business community is a part of it. I, uh, this semester, I had a PhD student working with my seniors and she just, she, her work for, this, for the class was just to prepare a survey for the Fishers, for the owners, for Narragansett town officials, and for homeowners from the Galilee Neighborhood Organization and, and other local groups. And she, had 100, she got 177 um, responses. It's not your set of 
of needs. But um, she's, she's finishing that for me now. But I, I, I looked at it, it's very good. Thanks, uh, thank you, Will. Any questions for Will? I just wanted to say thank you, and I really appreciate um, the visuals because I often drive through the Dale Carlier Corner, and I always wonder why Wakefield Liquors is so pushed far back, and there's just a sea of pavement. and And I, I appreciate that people imagine that it shouldn't be there. It should buildings should be close to the road to really build a walkable community. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can take this and sort of. Hopefully the planning board and the EDC, we've talked about this for years, try to move this forward. I know it's, like you said, multi-year project. We don't just raise everything and start over. They come in phases, but I, how do we get that ball rolling for that, for that core of town? Absolutely. I think that's what you're hoping to yep. have come out. Yep, that was sort of the intent to get you up here to get this ball rolling. We knew you had something good to show us. We wanted to see it. And uh, I'm very impressed with what I've seen. And uh, I do want to bring up the planning director next to figure out a way to sort of get this underway and sort of streamline this. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Thank you so Jamie, much. Jamie, come on up. So is this, is this the same communication? Yes, item? same item. Yep. Oh. All right, Jamie, before we move to that, this is Jamie, we're, uh, we're still talking on the uh, Bill Green's presentation here. So B, 9B. Uh, this is run communication 8E. We're not looking at that right now. Okay. okay. So uh, Jamie, in light of everything that we've seen here, I certainly have an appetite to put in place some sort of mixed use development overlay in areas of town to allow for mixed use zoning. Um, how long would it take? to sort of get something to the planning board, them to work something through, and then back to the council for us to review and, and enact. Mm -hmm. Two meetings. Quite the question. Uh, part of it is there's a whole analysis that has to occur. Um, part of it is the financing marketing side. You have a community of just over 31,000. You could be looking at, and some of those renderings, uh, another 200 to 300,000 square feet of retail. Will your community support that with a population of 31,000? What does your population need to be? What are the economics of adding that retail? What are the economics of adding the residential? It's not always just change the regulations, build it, and they will come. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have the resources in our department and hopefully with the passing of a, a new budget and the, the SIP program, that we have just over $100,000 uh, within the department. Our intentions uh, with a few moving pieces would be to do a RFQ, request for qualifications, to hire a exceptionally qualified consulting team to work with the municipality to develop the vision for the community. I could show you examples after examples of examples of regulations gone bad. I've worked in communities, well-intentioned regulations, unintended consequences. I think you as a community deserve better than some of the mistakes that have been made by other municipalities, including well-intentioned architectural design guidelines where they require pitched roofs, fenestration, bump outs, and I can, I, again, I could show you picture after picture where developments that you would be aghast at meet the regulatory standards of the code. Um, so again, there are a lot of moving pieces. I think in four to six weeks, we can have an RFQ out, but you're probably looking at six to nine to 12 months to do the proper analysis and development of regulations. Um, you have, Again, the economic side of this is exceptionally complex. To go to a, a property owner and ask them to do a two or three hundred million, some of the renderings you saw are two or three hundred million. Those people may not have any debt on their property right now. A simple redo of property could be 20 to 30 million. For someone who has a fully leased property with no debt, you're gonna try and convince them to move their tenants, tear down their buildings, 
rebuild the buildings and reinvest in their property and take on debt in an unknown marketplace because the retail aspect is changing almost daily. Um, it, it also on the retail side for delivery, Amazon, I don't know if the council's aware of this, Amazon has opened the last mile facilities, or the last 10 mile facilities. They have built them and mothballed them already. There are large buildings Amazon has built that are up, fully ready to be operational, but are not being put online. So that retail side's changing. Um, but again, as a department, I think the work that URI has done is exceptional as students, um, but it needs to be taken to the next step. And I don't want to push regulations through that are premature, that potentially will have unintended consequences, and then you're trying to undo something after it's already been done. I, you know, the planning board has done an exceptional job with the tools that they have in their toolbox to get high quality development within the community. But I'm sure uh, Maria Mack as the chair, as well as, the, well as the other planning board members, would appreciate a few more tools in their toolbox. So, so Jamie, just to be clear, the planning department does not have the resources to do this in itself internally. You're seeking a qualified expert to do this sort of analysis? We are not, we are handling an existing workload. We're a department of five with three professional planners, a GIS and administrative support staff. We have some of the technical expertise in house, um, but finding those blocks of time to accomplish a well involved and engaging study is is difficult. I have some skill sets with form-based code and architectural standards, um, but again, building that consensus, working with the community, having the charrettes, getting the feedback from the development community and the property owners, all takes time and resources. And if you want a product in the next nine to 12 months, the department cannot guarantee that. If you wanted it in the next two to three years, I could probably deliver that for you. And I'm, I'm trying to be realistic for you to, to not over-promise and under-deliver. It'll, it'll be um, a challenge just to manage a consultant over the next nine to 12 months with the shreds, with the public outreach, with the visioning, with the, sh the shredding aspect to develop a vision for this community. I'm not sure if this community is ready for three-story buildings or four, five, six-story buildings. Everyone says go, you know, kind of go big, go home. We would love to see four or five stories, but I'm not sure once you see that on paper and see the amount of stormwater management and then the infrastructure needed to support that as well as the traffic implications, the more retail you build, the more apartments the, you build, the more stress you have to your existing transportation system. So everything's interrelated. And again, putting the right team together with the qualified, you know, there are firms that exist in New England and nationally like Tool, DPZ, Union Studios, Code Studios, Opticos, uh, on the financial development side, Gorman and York out of, out of Connecticut. Uh, there are capable firms, um, primarily on the East Coast, that can assist you in doing this. We do also have the chair of the EDC here, if he wishes to speak on this. We will afford him a little time. But Jamie, just, uh, you know, I see this as just an, an opportunity, another tool, you know, in our ability as council to sort of foster an environment to allow for an increase in supply of affordable housing at a time when it's so scarce. I don't sort of look at this as something that's gonna sort of scare the community. I see this as an opportunity. Um, I'd rather not, us not sort of shy away from it. I'd sort of like to hit this aggressively and uh, sort of see what pops out, but obviously not do anything without the due diligence required to sort of enact something no, of I, such I magnitude. Um, President McAtee, I agree with you that, that it, it is not something to shy away from. It's something to take through the process and you know, well done uh, with the appropriate standards and regulatory controls. You could do something wonderful along that corridor. Um. But Larry, you are here. 
Um, and you are in tune very well with the uh, business community, so I want to give you an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Larry Fish from the EDC. Uh, first, I'd like to point out that Will Green's group has done wonderful work. We've been working with them on the Saugatucket River and, and that kind of thing. But if you look at the timeline, 2012, 11 years ago, there was a vision with charrettes, with the students' input. Great vision, but no input from the property owners. Nothing got done. Nothing got done by the town. No zoning changes, nothing. So the EDC did a survey of the property owners. What do they want? Because if they don't want anything, nothing is going to happen. You can't make them change their buildings. All right? So we went and we spent a year and a half, maybe? Tom's on my committee, so I can, I, uh, he'll correct me. A year and a half and did that survey, and we got tremendous results and input from every property owner at that time. Over 50% participation. And almost five years ago, we stood in this room with all those property owners and the town council, made a presentation of what their vision was and what they would like, tweak this, tweak that, to implement it five years ago. In that five years, Beat First is gone. Bombay Flame was, was Chen's, that's gone both times. You have uh, the Kenyan, uh, the lawyer's offices, they wanted to do something, but that's gone by the boards because in private business, you have to act. You can't wait for charrette after charrette after charrette. And I agree with, with, with uh, planning that I don't want to pave South County, and I don't want, you know, 10-foot, 10, 10 uh, ten-story buildings either. But if, you, if the council doesn't act, I'm in, I'm in private business. We make decisions. I know town government turns slow. But 11 years, and we're going to study more? I just think that there's a sense of urgency. I think you can, you can start some things now so that Plant Circus doesn't become something. Or Bobby G's, uh, I mean, plant, uh, you know what I'm talking about, clock bombs. Clock bombs. Uh, yeah, I mean, but uh, Bombay Flames is under development. Feet First is not yet. You, you've, you've got... Uh, Bobby G's, uh, the area of Burger King and, and Speedcraft is in a trust, so that could happen, that could change at any time. So you're, you're going to turn your wheels, government, and I'm not going to be here five years from now to point out that we have a storage facility where something, a uh, nice housing development would have been better there, you know, to help uh, with affordable housing. Time doesn't stand still while we study. So I agree to study it or whatever, but do something. All right, mixed use. Everybody wanted mixed use. Apartments up above, commercial. It helps with the affordability. Zoning, density, height of the buildings, uh, parking regulations. How many times do we need to study? And I, all I'm here for is to say, I don't want to be here again talking about the same thing five years from now, to a council that is twice removed from you guys as I did years ago. five years ago. Tom, do you want to add anything? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Deb, go ahead. Thank you, Larry, very, very much. I know that Maria Mack, the chair of the planning board, is here, so I didn't know since that's yeah. where it's headed. Yeah. Maria, come on up. Thank you. 
Thank you, President McEntee and members of the council for the opportunity to say a few quick words. Um, uh, thank you, Larry Fish, for what he said, and of course, Will Green for his presentation. And I think we're all wondering if that student who spent 76 hours a week got an A in the class. <laughs> um, this has obviously been a long time coming. It's something that we need to act upon immediately. There are many communities throughout New England and the US who have done a rezoning type project to um, add mixed use and specifically affordable housing, creating new neighborhoods, revitalizing their communities. Um, so this is an opportunity to enable um, the type of mixed use development that we want to see, not restrict it. And obviously what has occurred in the last 20 years with the current commercial highway zoning is not necessarily working for us at this point in time. So I would urge the council to support an endeavor such as this. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Maria. Any questions for Maria while we have her? So Maria, do you, I got one question for you. Do you agree that this is gonna take six to nine to 12 months, or do you think this could be sped up? So I'm not the budget person. <laughs> However, um, if you find the right consultant and you get moving along fairly quickly with this, again, a lot of what the consultants do is they look at other zoning regulations that have been adapted for other communities, and they do copy them to a certain extent, and then they tailor them for a particular community. So it's not always like they're starting from scratch, and I think that if you find the right person that is, um, has a lot of uh, projects in this type of a community, not just enormous urban uh, areas, um, we're a suburban community, and I think that uh, an experienced uh, person who is adept at creating design regulations and writing zoning code would be able to, again, depending on their uh, time frame, be able to do something hopefully before a two-year time frame. Thank you, Maria. Go ahead, Deb. So I feel like we hear, and I kind of feel like Larry Fish does, like, we've been wanting this. We, yep. We've been talking about this for a long time. We need to move the ball forward. But then I also hear and think in my head of all the things that the planning department is already working on. And so when you think about the rescue funds, you talk about, uh, you know, there's boards and commissions working on the Saugatucket Park project. There's boards and commissions doing, you know, multiple projects that come through development. And it just seems like there are not a lot of people to do the work. And then you think you're going to have these public meetings and then synthesize all this information and run the charrettes. So I, while I don't always want to hire a consultant, I think this project, hiring that person to advance it is actually makes sense because it's going to move it quickly. And that I wouldn't necessarily, don't always land on let's hire somebody else, but I feel like we have so many things that we want to get done that I would, I would lean toward what Jamie's saying, but push like Larry's saying that we can't let this go another term. I mean, I don't know if you, you, you must have been on the council when this came in 2018 that Larry's talking about, right? Five years ago. So I just don't want it to sit. Like I, I feel like that is a natural place where we can put housing, where we can make it the hub, the vibe of South Kingstown, and we just need to do it. And part of a negotiation that would occur with a proposal would also incorporate a specific time frame. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we, like, we do have very talented um, members on the planning board. I know we have an architect, we have an engineer, we have um, Maria's vast experience. Um, so we have a lot of talents. I just think we need to activate everybody and have their involvement as it goes forward. Would we be able to use ARPA money for a consultant should we decide to go that route? Yeah. Amy, do we already have the money set aside for this? So um, I'm just backing up, writing a few dates in my mind. When I first came here, and I believe tw I've been here two and a half years, I requested the funds in a program of $375,000 every year that gets pushed off. So as a planning director, I saw the need. I asked for the funds, mm -hmm. and again, I understand it's a competitive world. There are sometimes paving roads is more important than fixing a zoning code, and I absolutely understand that. You have, a, as part of our, the manager's report, 
there's an update on Horsley Witten mm -hmm. and a memo written on January 6th to the town manager. You'll see how we're, the department's trying to cobble together funds from different sources. Um, being able to cobble those funds together in this fiscal year along with an additional appropriation of SIP funds, it is now time where we feel we can tackle this project and have the appropriate resources and you know, not start it with $50,000 and then find out we don't have money. We have money to study it, but then we don't have the money to create the regulations. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we have the funds available um, to do it all. We can potentially look at American rescue plans, but I would like to do it outside of that. Um, again, as I prepare my department budget, I'll be asking for, again, consulting fees, and potentially that there'll be a slightly higher ask for that for this year to accomplish what you're trying to um, do. All right. So this is certainly a priority for me, and I think uh, this council as well. Um, I'd like to see this prioritized. If we can get this pushed up to the five to six month period to get something in front of us with Jamie, you monitoring a uh, qualified consulting team, that would be best. I'd rather, not this, I'd rather not see this go out a year. I'd rather see this sort of expedited, obviously yeah. with the due diligence needed to make this right. My only response to that, President McEntee, was um, working in this community and being familiar with it uh, over the past years and being a former graduate student in community planning at URI, is the department can write regulations, the consultant can write regulations, but without community involvement and community buy-in, they're gonna arrive with a nail in the lid of, of, of that very tight box. Um, so again, five to six months, we can go away, we can write regulations, but there needs to be buy-in, and this needs to be community-driven. Mm -hmm. And Larry Fish uh, appropriately articulated this evening that the EDC is on board uh, just last month, uh, this month actually, January 10th, we talked about it at the planning board. Uh, they're willing to move some funds around on an existing footy, funding uh, with the permission from the council um, to forward this initiative. Just want to take, Rory loves to set deadlines because I think he, I appreciate that about him, but I think it's really, it, if it's gonna take, what did you say, six weeks just to even get an RFQ, mm -hmm. and then six months. So he's, he's probably giving you six months once you, you see what I'm saying? It is, it is probably six to no, nine months. I understand. I'm just trying to express my I willingness yeah, to, urgency. Want to speed this up. Got you. So, so I think it's exactly what you want six months from when they get the consultant on board. Instead we we of don't want to turn this into a horsely wooden thing. Yeah, we don't like that. I do not want to do that either. So. All right. So I gave you, you're out to the six to nine months now. It's fine. I think perhaps based on this discussion, we can refer what we've discussed here substantively to the town manager and the planning department and the EDC. Yes. So if we wanna make a motion to that effect. No. You want me to do it? Okay. Oh, all right. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. Thank you, Will Green, Larry Fish, Maria Mack, Jamie Rabbit. Appreciate all your input on this. Very good information. At this point, we're going to move to the town manager's report. Thank you, Council President. <clears throat> um, there are three items. Now, before I turn over to Jamie, there's just a fourth item that I just have to add. It'll be, take me 30 seconds to explain it. So I got many calls this weekend um, about uh, beach access from members of the town council and members of the public. They were right. The wrong signs were put up. So uh, over by the town beach where the vanilla bean is, there's a path over there that was brought to our attention that uh, it created a dangerous position. There was a wall that washed out and it was concerned by members of the town uh, staff that people walking there could get injured, so they restricted some access. Not restricted it, but diverted it is the best word. But they put up the wrong signs, quite honestly. 
and they put no trespassing, which should not have been put on those uh, on those fences. It should have read, you know, hazardous area, use caution, something like that. So I'm glad whoever brought it to the attention of some of the council members. I'm glad that someone from the public brought it to our attention and we fixed it uh, within 24 hours. Uh, the second thing on the town manager's report, that, but the first thing I have listed is the update on the ARPA money uh, that um, uh, Director Rabbit will, will, uh, will go over now. I, I do have to say this though, that is one department that I bury with work. I know. Bury him. I mean, just some of the things that he's working on now, in all the departments are, are, I bury him, but uh, you know, the hospital, parking, BPAC, affordable housing, schools, bike path, the library. EMS. <laughs> so this, I just have to say that we, uh, I work them hard. So, uh, right. so Jamie, I'll turn it over to you to give uh, a briefing on the ARPA money, the $9 million that the town council uh, we received and appropriated, okay? Thank you, Mr. Manny. Um, my intent is to try and um, review this in a seamless manner at about 100,000 feet. If you need me to drop down lower, please ask questions. But it, this, I think this is intended to be a brief overview. I think the council at their last meeting talked about having a work session specific to opera uh, in the future. So just briefly going through and the council members have this. This is a pie chart representing the just over $9 million as it was voted on by the town council in February of 2022. There are a number of categories, uh, public investments in the village and downtowns, private public investments, nonprofits, housing, government services and municipality, municipal improvements, the EMS building at 1.1 million, the opera program management, and then there's a contingency of $120,000. Um, $120, and that contingency, and you may wonder why that appears now, there were some initial estimates that came out of the federal government of our appropriation just being over 8.9 million. That has been increased or solidified at $9,071,224. So that may be a different number than you're used to seeing at 8.9 million. Just breaking down a few of the categories and you'll see that this is highlighted uh, in green. So this corresponds to your Excel spreadsheet. The 3.49 million targeted for the villages and downtowns would be public investments. Those are associated with street lighting, landscaping, hard goods, sidewalks, fencing, placards, trail markers, traffic calming, wayfinding, bus shelters, and architectural design. Uh, one of the unique things there that the council originally approved in February was that architectural design aspect because part of the grant funding that we'll be looking at is facade improvements and business owners would have the opportunity to consult with our department and we would bring in consulting architect on board for certain business owners who didn't know how to articulate their vision as it relates to their facade, proposed facade improvements. We do have probably between five to seven business owners who are patiently waiting uh, for those facade improvement funds to be available yep. um, in, in specific to Wakefield. The next category was that private public investment. I just mentioned facade improvements that has 1.25 million in it along with signage, lighting, fencing uh, improvements. And again, that corresponds to the second largest category at 1.9 million. Our next categories are associated with uh, housing and social services and funding nonprofits. I would like to announce that we just did ha have our first uh, grant round applications. For housing, we had $375,000 available. We received five grant applications, totaling a request for $974,000. Uh, four, uh, four applications, um, met all of the requirements of the submission. Two of those applications would create uh, one of them four units, another one upwards of 10. There was another application for some funds for master plan services for an existing nonprofit. 
and another application for much needed improvements to a existing housing project within the town. And then the third was just a request for $375,000 to support the development of affordable housing with no specific project in mind. The grant side for social services, they received 22 applications. Uh, one that I mentioned uh, was really housing related, so it was moved over. That created our fifth housing application. So there were 21 applications for services. The total grant requests for those services were 433485 and the town had 425000 allocated. So that's pretty close to being in line with the funds available. So we're fairly confident we can do some great appropriations um, and make recommendations to the council to vote on. Also within there, uh, the next category was municipal investments, uh, natural resource officers. That uh, position has already been hired. Um, they have been here for just over 12 months working on your waterways and other environmental programs within the community. We have uh, upgrades to Office 365. Those were uh, purchased and installed. We have audiovisual upgrades to town council chambers. Those bids are due at the beginning of February. Uh, youth employment programs, discovery camps, after school mental health programs, uh, paramedicine EMS, as well as public safety and mental health staffing. I, I would note that you had four, just over 400,000 for potentially uh, two positions within the police department. They are initiating that program, but no officers have been hired for that program yet. I believe uh, Chief Moynihan is working with Mr. Manny in the town manager's office to also seek alternative funding outside of ARPA. Again, our goal, both in our department as well as the town manager's office, is for every dollar we get from the federal government to find alternative resources and matching funds for those programs. As we go through uh, the further breakdown, um, we did have the addition of a new project in February uh, that was beyond the original scope as adopted in July of 2021. That was the EMS building at 1.1 million. I don't need to remind the council members of what has happened to COVID and the delivery system for goods as well as the cost of goods that that 1.1 million uh, may be a very challenging number at this point in time. We have program management. Our original contract with Wesson and Sampson was $475,000. We have asked them to put all things not associated with the actual development of our village plans on hold. That will potentially free up a little over $200,000 in that contract. So you would potentially have some savings there. Uh, there was also a contingency of 24,000 in that fund uh, so again, if we had $500,000 originally programmed in that pie chart, we potentially can get that down to about 250,000. With a little bit of slippage, maybe three, but again, 200 to $250,000 in savings on that Wesson and Sampson contract. The reason being is uh, working with the finance department and Brian as the director, the Financial responsibility and reporting has changed at the federal side, so the finance department has been willing to undertake that independent of the consultant. So there's some internal savings and another department working a little bit harder uh, to initiate those cost savings. I already mentioned we the non-dedicated program funds of just over 120,000. That's primarily due to the difference between the 8.9 and the almost 9.1 that the federal government settled on for the town. Uh, just going back and looking at that pie chart again, and just a quick breakdown of another pie chart. This is just an example of 3.49 million and the different allocations within there. You'll see the largest one was for, for sidewalks at three quarters of a million dollars. 
Uh, we hope that with the Wesson and Sampson study, which we have the final uh, to the final draft under review, and we're giving comments back to Wesson and Sampson, so delivery of the final project should be about three to four weeks out where we can share it with the council. Uh, they would like to do that in a workshop setting and not just a half an hour before your meeting. Um, and it, it, it's a lot of information that really needs your feedback and expertise as representatives of the community. So that's my, my quick flight at 100,000 feet. I don't know if the council members have any questions uh, to date. Thank you, Jamie. Any questions for members on this? Mike, go ahead. Jamie, a couple of questions on the municipal investment uh, where you've got listed the line item for natural resource officer. I assume that's under uh, Chief Moynihan and the yeah. police department? That, that is actually not under the police department. Yeah. And I'll let Mr. Manny answer that. So that, that is the, um, that's listed under um, leisure services where the, uh, it's Mr. Stack, who's the harbor master. That was that position that was created where it's six months as a harbor master, six months doing compliance checks and so forth. He's actually, we put him on the uh, case of checking on those signs and access to the beach. So he's being utilized. There's one other point I want to bring up that Jamie brought up. <clears throat> There's about $3.5 million, you know, dedicated to the downtowns. That's the money we're trying to leverage. So, you know, there are federal grants for infrastructure that we're really, you know, that was a, that was a whole other project you had to work on that um, you had to work with. We're going through RIFTA, actually, because that's a, t a state road, Main Street. And all RIPTA is going to be the main applicant for that funding from the feds for infrastructure. And we have a be much better chance of getting money, whether it's $4 for every dollar we put in or a dollar. It's, it's the chances are much better by going through a state agency to get it, and they, they divvy out the money. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions for Jamie? I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you. This is very helpful. I've seen multiple presentations, and this, uh, I think, is very clear to people who are new. Um, I just had a question. Are we going to um, actually go out as, um, it says grants and contract manager, two years? Are you going to, is that something that you're going to put in your budget, Jim? Like, we haven't talked about that. Um, sorry, which one is that one? That, what line? It says grants. It's in the blue section. Grants and... Oh, municipal investment. Mm -hmm. that, that is covered. Um, we're actually trying to reduce that number, but that's covered under the opera money, correct, Jamie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you going to advertise for that position shortly? or Because it, it, it's a placeholder for 200000 300000 yeah, If I can correct that. So if you look, there was an initial appropriations oh, and I'm then distracted. an adjustment to that. So that original grant administration program okay. was for the consultant at 300000 Oh, so that, oh, I see. Yeah. So that is not for a staff position. That was for consulting yeah. services. Okay. And, and that's the consultant that we did hire. Correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think we actually cut some of that money. The initial amount was like five hundred thousand. Yeah. Right? Yes. The contract came in at four seventy five, and I, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to reduce that for government released uh, a lot of the restrictions on spending this money. They want you to spend it. And, um, and so they released a lot of the restrictions that initially they had. So the amount we brought it down is about $200,000 to the 300, it was 500. But one thing I would caution is, if we're gonna, any money that's shifted around in here, that EMS building is gonna cost more than 1.1, we know that. So anything we save, we're trying to funnel into that. that w and we agree. I, I mean, I would agree that that would be the way I would do it. Because I think that. Again, I haven't adjusted the, I, I haven't made any assumptions like that 120 contingency. I, I would, you know, mentally I'm funneling that over the EMS. Yeah. As Mr. Manny mentioned, the savings on the grant administration, if we can funnel that to EMS, you know, that's two or $300,000 already. I think we need to probably be about 1.6, 1.7 for that building, just given supply chain and the additional costs associated with that supply chain. So Jamie, I know we anticipate uh, getting some of the housing social service money sort of out the door in the next few months. What about the village downtown public investment and private public investment? When do we anticipate sort of deploying that money? So we would hope, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 
staff is in the process of doing their final markup of those draft reports. Those would need to um, be finalized by Wesson and Sampson's and then in a workshop session come before the town council. We have the five villages, as I mentioned, well, I didn't mention it. We have Matunic, West Kingstown by Amtrak. We have Kingston by Tony's and Dollar General in that strip between URI and Curtis Corner. Peacedale, Wakefield, and Matunic Beach area. You have roughly $6 million allocated to those villages. I think there was initial discussion by the council that you didn't want to sprinkle money too lightly in all five areas where you would never notice a change and potentially earmark a substantial amount of money in one of two of those areas to try and maximize the return on investment. That decision will not be made by um, us as a department. I think that's a decision town council will have to do. And once you make a decision on where you're gonna spend the bulk of your funds, it, if it happened to be Wakefield, then we would initiate those programs and grant grant programs for facade improvements. We didn't want to do that prematurely in West Kingston or Kingston or Matunic Village if you decide to do all your improvements in Peacedale. So three to four weeks, we should have the final documentation from Weston and Sampson's. With slippage, I would say the end of February, perhaps your first meeting in March. And then even knowing when those are being delivered, start to schedule that work session. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's only 52 Saturdays in a year. My wife occasionally reminds me of that. There are a lot of weekdays in a year, but not too many Saturdays. But I potentially envision it, unfortunately, as a, a Saturday morning, two to three hour uh, session with the consultant, really diving deep into what that report and what their vision is for the community and then your response to that. All right. So then from that point, after we've had that meeting, how soon after that do you think we'd start to sort of deploy some of these funds? I'm trying to get an idea when you know these monies will be out the door and starting to be used. I think if you, if you in early March had a workshop and made decisions on where your spend plan is being focused, uh, we could in early spring start to do those grant um, forms and application process and uh, maybe by sun, summer, early four, four, uh, excuse me, early fall, start to distribute those facade improvements and Excellent. some of the other, again, they're for landscaping and fencing and signage and, and facade improvements. So there's a bunch we can have hit the street at the same time. Excellent. All right, any other questions for Jamie on this? Great job. All right, thank you, Jamie. Well thank done. You. We're going to move to our next item on the town manager's report. I think that's still you, Jamie. If you just bear with me, I'm just going to log off. Hopefully that'll go away. Um, just with regards to the Horsley and Witt, and I gave the council members copies of uh, memos to Mr. Manny on January 6th regarding the status of Horsley Witt. And as you discussed or was alluded to earlier, this is a project that began back in October of 2018. Uh, no one envisioned a pandemic that lasted almost two years. And as I say, lasted almost two years. There's an unknown finish date to that, I guess. Um, in discussions with the planning board as recently as this month, there was sediment on their behalf that the study, uh, because of its time frame and its initial scope, has uh, lagged and the information is almost stale to no fault of Horsley and Witten. Horsley and Witten has done a, a phenomenal job along with Union Studios providing information to the planning board. But in talking with Horsley Witten, we do have the opportunity to potentially end that contract where it is and I'll let you know where it is. So in the original contract, there was a discussion on missing middle. So missing middle is everything between a single family home and a large scale, uh, you know, five, six, seven story apartment building. 
and it's everything in between. So it's the duplex, the triplex, the townhouse, the mansion home, the small apartment, and the slightly larger apartment complex or condo development. We have completed everything but the large apartment complex and mixed use housing. My proposal and discussion with the planning board was to potentially end the contract with Horsley and Witten, which would potentially free up an additional $20,000 that was originally targeted for that study and for the creation of affordable housing. Move that to a new mixed use study with a new consultant focused on mixed use on Old Tower Hill. And in the second memo from January 6th, I showed you how we would use existing funds from the SIP from 2021, $60,000, 30 of which is in the planning department. Another 30 was a grant we received from Rhode Island Commerce, along with an additional $30,000 requested in this year's SIP, uh, along with potentially 25,000 remaining in the Horsley Witten study to cobble together uh, almost $149,000 to undertake that mixed use study of the upper portions of Main Street, Route 108, and Old Tower Hill Road. Excellent, so Jamie, would that require a council vote? To end, it, the, and again, I have a talk with finance and, and with Mr. Orsillo. The original hundred, there was originally $100,000 that was in a affordable, house, affordable housing account. That was given to the planning board to do the Horsley Witten st study. So we have to kind of, whoever appropriated the original 100 to the planning board has to kind of agree to reappropriate the 20 to a different program, in essence, for the f same thing. We could complete the mixed use, a small segment of it, in the existing Horsley Witten study. But I just think the four year lag time of that study has you know, made it stale. You're on a third town council, and I think there's only two original planning board members uh, who were involved with that original study. So again, it's removing that money. But we wouldn't be able to enter into a contract with any consultant because it exceeds the five thousand dollar threshold. So that would that contract for a consultant to do the mixed use would come back to the council. All right. Any questions for Jamie on this? All right. Seeing none. Thank you, Jamie. Very good update. Then we're going to continue. We got one more on here. Yes. A uh, very quick update on the school building committee by uh, Luke Murray, the, he's the uh, chair of the school building committee. Good evening. I guess that's my cue to be quick, right? Um, so I'll just give you an update uh, that I, a little bit of what I sent out over the weekend um, to the elected officials and for the benefit of the public who are listening. So I, I did iterate to the council that we'd be having a meeting this week. Unfortunately, I could not get that coordinated due to conflicts of schedule. So tonight I have posted a meeting for next Thursday, February 2nd at five o'clock. Um, so that is on the Secretary of State site. The website has also been updated. So if you wanna communicate that to the public, that would be appreciated. Um, I did send, as you know, a meeting to the school committee, a uh, memo to the school committee, um, letting them know about the, what was communicated on December 12th at our presentation and the need to sit down with council on the financial matters. So that has been communicated, and I believe there's been some action in the background on that. The school committee had a meeting, as you may know, on the 17th. Um, I wasn't aware of that meeting, unfortunately, or I would have gone, but um, I did hear from that meeting that there was discussions of swing space and some concerns there, and then other you know, uh, aspects of the financials. So knowing that, as I communicated, it took some action to do some vetting in advance on potential swing space options, knowing that's going to be discussed at our next meeting. So um, trying to move things along as, as I can, um, awaiting those financial decisions. Um, wetland flagging has been taking place at CCMS and Broad Rock, which is really um, intentional to start vetting out athletic facilities and seeing what our restrictions are on both sites. So again, trying to keep that data gathering going, awaiting decisions. 
I've also been reached out, reaching out to um, RIDE on what's called the Facility Condition Index. We initiated a study of both Wakefield Elementary and CCMS to get an updated index because that could affect our bonus structure moving forward. So if we are hit a 65% index, we would be eligible for that additional 5%, which would push us up to the 52. So we're hopeful that that will be the case. Um, that wasn't the case previously, so RIDE recommended that we move forward with that study. Um, and then as I iterated, we are looking to get a project master schedule uh, together for the public to ensure that everyone is aware of what the process is upcoming. What I've communicated to the architect is start with the end date and work backward. We need to know each hit, date, and milestone and what the critical dates are. So you know, and the school committee knows, what is expected and when. Because if we don't hit those dates, as you know, we are on a very restrictive timeline, then it's my job to communicate that very clearly and let you know that those dates are coming and we need to, to move action. And if we don't move action, it could cause a disruption on the project. Um, very last, I, I've iterated in my email about the appointment of another school building committee member. Um, it's becoming concerning for me because we've been operating as a unit of eight, which is the even number, and we haven't had uh, another member, that, that last ninth member, show up since day one. So I'm really, and that is a, a position that this body voted to have the school committee appoint. Um, so I've, I've um, sent an email to the, to the superintendent previously. I will do it again to, to move action on that. Sure. Yep. Oh, I, okay. Go ahead. Any questions? So, Working backwards from what you said, so I would suggest that when you that we ask Mark Prince if he can't appoint somebody to just rotate the principals through because it's supposed to be an educational visionary and he, you could just rotate through your bench and he could do that. So it, it we have talked about it and he, ha, he they've talked about it at meetings. We we should ask if he can't name one person have all the principals. It's, we, it's one school district, so put them all up through it and they can all rotate. Can we do that, Mike? Yeah. It's on the agenda, yes. No, no, no. Oh, I mean, to have a, nine people on a committee, one of which is not an actual named person, it's just a title? You have lots of discretion with that committee. Okay. Or, or we, should, we should find someone else. So I, I would say I, I watched their special meeting. I recommend that you watch their special meeting. There's a lot of good information there, and they have, a, they have a lot of good discussions, one of which is the CTE, early childhood really has to be a CTE K to 12. There's a lot of discussion about swing space, money, all this stuff. I want to, we could recognize, I think Carol Vetter, we could, we could either put, ask someone to go on. I always speak with Carol Vetter, who has a really good command of the numbers, the enrollment, the capacities, and if I have questions, I was asking her all of those questions, I recognize that we can't all do that, but putting another person who's invested in the project, that might be another option. Um, I also want to note that Melissa Boyd asked for the school committee, and this is for the public, that they have a special meeting once a month where they only talk about the school facility bond. I think that was a great idea. I think you all got that email. Just to, it can't be done in their two hour business meeting. So they, they it, and so, her asking for it, I think is a good idea, and hopefully the community will get on board and attend. I think that's really important. Um, I also feel like just watching it for two hours, I think we all need to be in the same room to learn together. I think they are putting out information, and then either I'm relaying it to someone else or relaying it to Jim, and hearing all of that, we would have all benefited from understanding how challenging just the preschool Relocating the preschool is a challenge. It, and so we, we just need to, either we need to have an identified common meeting where we meet and learn whatever they're learning at the same time, so we, it might reduce the lag. So something to think about is once they know when their meeting is, if we wanna tag along and come or have it here. Because I think we're losing even time in the, in, in, information passed back and forth. It's a challenge. If they're not gonna meet till February, we're already into February. So, and I also think they don't understand a lot of the questions they're, or what we're asking for. They spent a lot of time 
asking, saying we don't have this information yet, but we will get it. And it's the same information that we're still seeking. If, if they can realize any savings and what do they really need for a project, um, there's a lot there. There's a ton there. And uh, I, I, we just need to figure out how we can be active in supporting that. And I think common meetings would help at least, I don't know when we're having a meeting with them as a group. See, see the- We've requested February 9th, but haven't- We requested February 9th. Uh, I do not believe we've heard back yet. So, okay. So this, I, I got the impression that it's a lot of nobody, they think the school building committee is supposed to do something, the school, school building committee thinks the schools committee is gonna do something, and we're sitting around watching. So that if you it, watch the meeting and you'll see, I think all being in the same room could advance some, some of these things a little more quickly. You're nodding. So just the preschool alone was a lot of information. There's no place to put the preschool. I mean, their suggestion to go back to South Road doesn't make any sense. It's functioning at fine at Wakefield. Let's not invest resources flipping the preschool. But if we don't sit in the same room, we don't, we wait weeks yep. to transfer information. Yep. So uh, the school committee receives the budget from the superintendent on February 14th, Tuesday. I'm hoping by that time that they'll have more information to answer some of the questions that we've been asking uh, specific to the uh, school facilities. So I'm thinking maybe February 16th at this point. I mean, I don't see how they can say at that point that they don't have the information yet. They're not willing to do the ninth, which we don't know yet. So, so it should be. I think. I think the original plan was to try and get them before the February fourteenth yeah. to give the council a heads up on what. So that's why I think we asked for February ninth. Yeah. Um, but like I said, we have. It's not definitive. We haven't heard anything yet. But if we can't get the ninth, there's exactly. no reason we shouldn't be able to get the sixteenth. Yeah. So a lot of their conversation was, we don't know what the governor's budget's going to be, so we can't tell you. But what the governor's budget. But it doesn't matter what the governor's budget. We were asking, could you say, did you save any money? Like, that's a finite number or a number. They may say, we saved $500,000 by doing this with Curtis Corner, but we need $750,000 for contractual obligations. We, we just need to know that, have you organized the realization of the savings? They, they don't, they're, they're stuck in, we need to know what the governor's budget is. What you save isn't anything to do with what your expenses are. That's why I think there's confusion. Understood. So I don't know how we get in the same room. I think we, we, we should, perhaps as a group of five, come up with some dates and say, these are the dates we're willing to meet. Because I'm really worried. So we got February 9th as sort of an offer to them. They haven't responded. I think February 16th is a good alternative considering that the school committee gets their budget on February 14th. Um, I mean, they're still stuck on whether the governor's budget is going to hold them harmless. So I get that. But as far as the other concerns, they should have an idea as to what those figures are. So I'm hoping that they do and they will. And let's see what they come back with. I mean, we can't compel them to meet with us, but when it comes to this, we have to work together to get this done. So we'll see what they come back with. Well, February 20th is a, is the, we don't meet that, that Monday, is that, I'm just trying to find one other date to offer. I'll meet any, any I day. I will meet. I will make it work any oh, day that they agree to. Is that to. a holiday? Yeah. It's not a holiday for me, so, okay. So, that's not good, but maybe, I'm just trying uh, to prevent, pre 21st. present all alternatives. So, the 21st is a, is a good option, like at 6. Mm -hmm. We just have to try to keep having a meeting. Yep. I still want to push for the 9th. You want the ninth? So that the options are the ninth, sixteenth, and the twenty-first. Where are you at, Matt? Yes, good. Mike, um, a quick question on what you were talking about before with our discretion on replacing a member of the school building committee. And maybe I'm remembering this wrong. The seat that has been the issue because it was a personnel issue. Right. Um, does, is it the charter that requires that it be a person with educational expertise? I believe that is one of the five positions that there was a specific 
And, and I think Deb's comment is that, okay, the principals have that educational expertise. If you can't pick one, at least have two or three come. But. That's fine. And even the suggestion of Carol Vetter, frankly, I think would be a great idea. The school committee did originally recommend um, two people be appointed from the school committee. Well, this, we, we just if need it. It works under the charter. It's fine. I think, he, I think he's required to have that educational person. So I think that's the issue. I think we just need, I don't understand why it's so hard to solve that problem. So if I may, that, that is actually a ride requirement. It's not a charter requirement. And ride is pretty flexible on that. I've gone through this before with them. Um, I've seen some building committees throughout the state have uh, committee members, school committee members. They can be teachers, they can be principals. Um, the way it reads is knowledge of the educational mission and functions of the facility. So anybody who has general knowledge of how schools run, that's what they're looking for. So I don't think it has to be associated with specific position in the organization. Makes sense. All right. Thank you, Luke. Uh, any other questions while we're here? Okay, we're going to move on. We move to item 10, comments from interested citizens. Sorry it took us a while to get here, but at this point I ask you, anyone who wishes to speak to come on and address any issue they like. I just first ask that they identify yourself and we're gonna limit you to five minutes. I know what's, I know what's going on every time I come up to the uh, podium, town manager leaves the room. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, um, the governor's budgets out came out on Friday. And in fact, the school district is getting more money than they got last year. So that's the good news. Um, unless the federal government or the state mandates universal pre-K, the pre-K program could go back to where it was in Peacedale. In fact, on the first floor, the main floor of Peacedale, there's a whole little, I think it's the southeast corner of the building, that first floor. Those, all those classrooms were, were created for, for pre-K. Small, small, you know, small desks, the, the, the toilet facilities, everything, it's already there. But the world. I, talk, I, I just want to stop. I, I asked Carol every question, and so she said that the Peace Tale is going to have the whole, the fifth grade stay, it's going to be full. We talk, we, it's, it's at 450 right now. If you hold the fourth grade and the kindergarten comes in, you're going to be full at Peace Tale. Okay. She said she might ha the, there might be one classroom. In terms of capacity, it's not going to work right now. In terms of equipment, it could in a year or two. Okay. Um, I defer to Carol. <laughs> just saying. Carol. So, uh, um, Sorry to do that. The workers' housing thing that I mentioned before, you know, with uh, Columbia Street, you could probably, at a minimum, you could get like 100 units in there. But it probably could be more. You could also have a, a mixed retail on the first floor on the Columbia. And, and the, the three-story building next to it. I think it, I think it's worth looking into, and not just gutting the whole thing and destroying the, all those that entire facility, when we could turn it into affordable housing, which is workers' housing, which is which this town desperately needs for our police our police policemen, for our nurses, for our te younger teachers, for just town residents low and moderate housing, we're, 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 we're crying for it. But all we do is talk about it. Um, the CIP, um, one thing, if you've ever been to uh, the, the, the recycle facility on, 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 on uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the town, place down there, kind of brain dead. Broad Rose, Hill. Rose Hill, thank you, sir. Rose Hill Road, 
we have the free library. It's made out of cinder block. It's, it, it's a dump, okay? People use that all the time. You go there on the weekends, that people are in there all the time. It's dank, the roof, the, the trim for the roof is, is rotting, the shingles on the sides, on the, on the, on the peaks on either side need replacing, the th it has no heat, no light. It, you know, I mean, we can do better, it's town property. If we're gonna have that facility there for people, for the town residents, we should, we should spruce it up. We should, or knock it down and build something decent or move it somewhere else. It, it's, it's awful. Um, if you need an extra person on the school committee, you could ask me. I think I probably know more about what's going on in, this, in the schools and what's happened with the school building project there's, than anybody in, in this in this town. I'm serious. I I, I don't usually crow, you know, cockle to do my own stuff. But um, the town vac, you know, the vacancy list. It's in the every th at every meeting. The vacancy list. And if, so the vacancy list. What you have there is you'll say so and so was interviewed on such and such a date. And I, I looked at the list from, for tonight that's in there. So it says, so-and-so was interviewed in March of 2022. Okay, did that person get appointed? If somebody's, okay, so why would their name still be in there if, if, they, got, if, they, got, if they got interviewed over almost a year ago? And if, if you, <laughs> I don't understand that and also, you should put in there if somebody's actually appointed, you should be in there. It's just weird. Um, I'm almost done. Studio Jade, okay, what last thing? I uh, just wanna ask you to. Yep, Studio Jade, um, they're doing really good work, but they're not the architectural firm to design a new high school. They're a relatively young, firm the little over a decade they've been in, in business i did i looked at their portfolio when they were first hired and i could only find that they that they've designed and they had built one high school in their in their 12 or whatever years of of, of existence and that's the the um in providence the um the, the tech school, yeah. okay? That's the only one. That's not who you need to, to do the architectural work. I'm sure um, Luke knows about that, but you need to hire, like when we were went to see, when we went to visit East Providence, and I th Mr. Uh, uh, Marin, I think, can back me up on this. We went to see visit East, East Providence, one, two things they said to us was, this last, last comment, two things they said to us was, number one, hire a firm that's done the work, that's designed a lot of buildings because they know what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Thank you. Laurel, did you want an answer about the appointments? Because I think the clerk was going to give you some information about that. It's just quick. You can come up. So the reason why the ones that just said were interviewed, that means they were not appointed and we do have to keep their applications on file for a year. And I don't believe, I think that was for the planning board, correct? Um, we don't have a vacancy for that anymore. So if one was to pop up again, we would ask them if they wanted to be interviewed again and so on and so forth. Got it. Thank you. Sort of the injured reserve list. Brad Harrington, 2 Lab Hill Drive, Wakefield. What I was going to speak about, it's a moot point now because the council voted on what they were going to do with these private roads. I have some uh, things I'd like to discuss and I'd like feedback because shut up and go away doesn't do well with me. Anyway, 
these private roads, um, I don't know why they're still doing it. I kind of didn't know why they're doing it. You see it in our, t well, I know about Charles, Charlestown, you see a lot of it where they have their associations and they're 64 pages long and it tells you how you have to maintain the road. You can't pave the road. You got to do the catch basins. You got to do this. You got to plow your road. All these different things. And the towns, it's, it's a win-win for the town because there's no, they're not giving any town services. It's all on the dimes of the residents. Well, as you said earlier, a lot of these private roads, there was no associations. They were just built. And all of the things you talked about, you had brought up about, you know, they're not the town codes, they're not this, they're not that, which I have trouble with because as I built a, uh, added on a room, you know, you either follow the code and get, the, get everything all signed off and dotted on and everything's done, or you don't get the permit. Correct me if I'm wrong, with these private roads, the only one that benefits is the builder and the town because they can pass on all of the uh, maintenance to the homeowners, um, but the builder gets a break because he gets to pass on all of these. Well, you don't have to make them this wide, you don't have to put these sidewalks, you don't have to put this. Long story short, when we did the, um, he just had a reevaluation, and I called about that, and I said to the evaluator when she called me back, I said, you know, do you make any adjustments because I live on a private road? Oh, absolutely not. I've been doing this for 30 years, and we never make adjustments for that. We don't. So why is it fair that the person that lives on the private road who has to grade the road, plow the road, repave the road, and pay for all these things, pay the same tax, you know, amount of tax money as the person across the street who's getting these things? So all I'm saying is, where's the adjustment for that? And if, if the council isn't where I need to go, if you can please let me know who I need to email, and I'd like to start this process. Because I just think that Tell me where I'm wrong. Why should I sit here and live on a private road and basically say, tough? You're going to pay just like the guy across the street who's getting all, all the services that you're not getting. I mean, anything? So if I, if I may. Um, Go ahead. So I, I don't know if you heard me mention before, but I do live on a private road. I heard so that, I, and I, I, this I gentleman too, yeah. Your, you know, where you're coming from. But um, there is a process to have a road accepted by the town. That's, and that's what I want included in the letter that will go out to those um, yeah, but individuals. So, like you said, if you're building a permit and you follow all the rules, then well, it goes I, through. You get the permit, right? So, if you bring your road up to code, whose cost? I mean, I, I knew when I when I purchased my house. I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't. That when you buy a house on a private road, that is your responsibility. Yeah, I came from Coventry, and I was um, there my entire life these last three years. So, so the there is a process to get that ball rolling. Hmm. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> um, I tried. It's it's not. It's a lot of work. Um, but as far as you mentioned developers, and I I don't know if that because we have gone through this recently with Michaela Court and having the town roads accepted by the developers. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit, Mike? I, I don't know if that's helpful information. So no road today is accepted by the town unless it meets subdivision standards and that's actually been the case for a long, long time. Obviously there are many roads that exist that did not and that's why they're private roads, not town roads. But as Jess is saying, anyone who lives on a private road, if you have an association and you want to bring your road up to subdivision standards, there's a whole process that you can go through. Now, that takes money, of course. That, that of course, takes money. And, um, and the answer really is, I know you're saying you didn't know. I live on a private road, and by God, I knew before I bought my house that I was on a private road, I knew I had to pay for snow plowing and maintenance and brush cutting, and that I have to pay for garbage pickup, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, it, so well, let's well, let's double back then. Forget the me getting my road brought up to town standards. What about the reduction on my property value because you're living on a private road? So, um, property values are determined by um, the market. And the assessor under state law has to assess full and fair cash value. If, in fact, the houses were selling for less 
because, as you say, the services weren't there. That would be reflected in your tax bill. But if the houses are selling for just as much, and, and frankly, in a lot of cases, they're selling for more because people like the idea of living on a private road and they can keep people from coming in and out of those roads. So it all depends on what the market is going for in your neighborhood. That's what the assessor has to look at, the values, and it's based on resales or, or sales. Uh, one other thing I'd like to add <clears throat> is a lot of services this town offers. Mm. Some get them all, some get none. So I live on a private road, I knew exactly what I was getting into. I'm talking as a private citizen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I knew 25 years ago when I bought, it was a private road, I'd have to maintain it. I'd have no water, I'd have no sewer. But I still accepted, okay, that's where I wanted to live. But also look at the schools. I don't have any children in the schools. I don't know if you do or not. But so where do you draw this line? So it would be a per diem. You have to pay for each service. So I understand your frustration. Uh, you know, it's, but we live in a community. It's a shared expense to live in this community. Years ago, they did an expansion of the sewer system in this town, long before I was a town manager. And I remember that the town manager at the time made the conscious decision to pass that cost to every citizen in this town, every resident of this town. And I didn't particularly think that was fair, but now that I'm in this role, it's a community and these have to be shared costs, otherwise no one, only the rich would be able to live here and that we'd be subsidizing. You could never come up with a tax rate where you're, Someone with sewers pays less, someone with water, uh, someone who doesn't have sewers or water pays less, someone who doesn't have snow plowing pays less, someone who doesn't have children in the schools pays less. It, it would not work. All right. Thank you. Larry, come on up. <laughs> I just wanted to ask uh, Jim Marcello, uh, did, does the council have to make a motion and pass a motion to move the money that Jamie was talking about from one to the other. Uh, in the budget, that they'll be. Um, all right, that's the budget for next year. He's talking about monies already in the current fiscal year. There's and a process whereby monies can be shifted. I, I was going to say because. Rory, you could save a month of your time by passing something tonight that allowed him to, to uh, have the money to go out for the RFQ, which he doesn't have right now, yep. all right? So the process of doing that, if you're waiting till next fiscal year or the, or, the, or the new budget or any of that kind of stuff, because he's also including some of next year's funds, I don't know what the, the legal aspect of it is, but if you can act, because you're all in agreement, you can save yourself a month. I, I don't I, know if we could. Exactly. No, I... Uh, I'll see you next year. Tried. Thank you, Larry. All right, anyone else wish to speak in the audience? Yes, I, I think you're still going to talk about cannabis, marijuana. Is that, is that also on tonight's agenda? Just an order of notice. Just to issue a notice of a public hearing to have at the next meeting. So the substantive conversation will be at the next meeting. Okay. Um, this is what I, when I did some research on cannabis growing, it's, it's um, depending on how it's done, it, it can use you know, a, a significant amount of water. Mm -hmm. So when you had the, the gentleman here from the brewery, the issues about water usage and and um, taxing those sewer okay. stuff, sh you should just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doral. Thank you, Doral. All right, anyone else in the audience wish to come up and speak? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on. It's going to bring us to item 11, appointments. 
Make a motion to appoint Amy Crawford to the Affordable Housing Collaborative. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, the motion passes. It's gonna bring us now to 12 new business. Item A is a resolution authorizing the town clerk to advertise for order of notice of public hearing relative to proposed text amendments to the zoning ordinance associated with the sale, cultivation, and or manufacturing of recreational cannabis to include the creation of cannabis overlay districts within the town's existing commercial highway and industrial one districts to consider a proposed amendment to the town's zoning map to create the three new cannabis overlay districts as shown on exhibit two attached here too. Motion to approve 12A. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, the motion passes. It's gonna bring us to item B, a resolution authorizing the town clerk to advertise for order of notice of public hearing relative to proposed amendments to the town code chapter 17 taxation that would add article eight waiver of interest for qualifying quarterly tax payments as shown in exhibit three attached here too. Motion to approve 12B, second. We have a motion and a second, any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. Item C is a resolution referring to the planning board proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding election signs or political signs for review as further described in a memorandum from the town solicitor to the town council dated January 17, 2023. A motion to approve 12C. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. It's gonna bring us to 12G, a resolution authorizing an award of bid to municipal leasing consultants of Grand Isle, Vermont for a tax exempt master lease purchase program in accordance with all bid specifications for an amount for an annual interest rate of 4.12% for a five year tax exempt master lease for the purchase of a new replacement ambulance in an amount not to exceed $350,969, including the purchase price of the ambulance at $340,969 an estimated closing cost of $10,000 is further described in a memorandum from the finance director to the town manager dated January 19, 2023. So I'll make a motion to approve 12G, but if I, it's a big number, so for people who weren't listening to the work session, if you could just really quickly explain that. I'll second and then. So 12G and H are related. One is uh, G is for the lease and H is to accept the uh, award the bid for the uh, rescue vehicle. <clears throat> These emergency vehicles are in very short supply. There's a two-year wait on this. We need a rescue vehicle fairly soon and uh, EMS vehicle, and they're very expensive. Um, but th that's the price. There's no bargaining. There's nothing you can do. Rather than trying to budget in a CIP, we could never come up with that kind of money in that short period of time. So this is the first time we've done a big lease. This lease makes sense. We're spreading it out over five years, and we own it at the end so we can keep it. It's, it and it's equivalent to whether if we were putting a CIP amount of money in there or financing it or whatever. So this lease does make sense. The staff has shown me that it does, including the finance director. And it's a great way to get that vehicle it in is. a timely fashion. There's one other point I wanna make on this though. We need two of these. And the staff came to me for two. So because if we open a new EMS station, we, this one's gonna replace one that we need now, EMS. So that's, you know, what kind of, but that's a lot of money. That's seven hundred thousand dollars that we would. But we do need two. But this is an example of the staff doing more with less. Talking to the chief, uh, Mr. Stanley, he, he, we're gonna we're gonna keep these vehicles going as long as we can, as long as it's safe. But um, you can see the needs of the town are there mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to emergency vehicles. I just have to bring that up to you. I think this is a great way to think outside the box on this and get what we need with what we've got. So what's scariest to me is you use the word lease even though at the end of the five years we're owning it. So it's like a financing plan? It is. Okay. It's fine. So I'm just curious why you would use the word lease then. So it's a lease for the Because we have to, because it truly is a lease. We could turn it in if we want. Oh. At any But time. we don't. We don't want to. Okay. The, 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 I have good uh, people with the brains of the operations in the back of the room over here. <laughs> But no, it definitely makes sense. It was explained to me, we need it now. This is the only option we have right now, other than we just pay the whole thing right out or. Is there a plan for the second one? There is. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the vehicles that come across my desk, very few make it past me um, because we need to do more with less, especially now. But, um, but the, next, the plan is a year from now, put in for the next one. And, or, or we're gonna apply, for, and I try to ask my staff, Look for federal grants before you come to me for anything. There is a chance we could get some type of 
grant for a rescue vehicle is a chance. Um, and that's something we'll be working on. If we order it now and pay for it now, we don't have a chance. So within a year, I'm hoping we maybe could get a grant for the new EMS station for a vehicle, and if not, then we'll budget for it then. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. All right, we do have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, the motion passes. That's gonna bring us to item H, a resolution authorizing an award of bid to Bulldog Fire Apparatus Demers Ambulances of Westport, Massachusetts for one Type 1 2023 Ford F450 4x4 ambulance per bid specifications in an amount not to exceed 340969 as for the described in a memorandum from the Chief of Emergency Medical Services to the Town Manager dated January 17, 2023. Motion to approve 12 each. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, the motion passes. It's going to bring us to item I, a resolution authorizing an award of bid to United Site Services Northeast Incorporated of Westboro, Mass. for portable restroom services for the 2023 and 2024 seasons based on bid pricing received in accordance with all bid specifications and as further described in a memorandum from the Director of Leisure Services to the Town Manager dated January 18, 2023. Motion to approve, 12 aye. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Go ahead. Is there a bottom line on that? I noticed that you've got it broken down by unit. We budget $6,500 approximately this year for uh, Porta Johns. So we have them at Tuckertown, uh, when the when the restrooms are closed, um, Curtis Corner, Brusso, they're a hundred dollars per. We don't have a bottom line because there are times when we don't put out uh, Porter Johns. We use them for special events, um, things like that, rentals, parades. So um, we go by the per unit cost, which is uh, uh, proposed at a hundred dollars, I believe. That was and part of the reason I was asking because I figured with the three hundredth. We, we're going to need, need them for those and, and as events come up. And we need them more and more in the wintertime when we don't have water on in the restrooms at some of the parks. So we are seeing um, the need for actually more in the winter. Thank you, Terry. Any further discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, that motion passes. That's motion complete. to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn, a second. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.